of your life a very good evening on behalf of the scientific committee of the aios i welcome you all to this global webinar on cataract case files in this covid era webinar have become a new normal both for learning and teaching the concept of video case based files is basically aimed at giving a take home pearl to the audience as we cruise through this webinar we will have two keynote addresses and a 4 minute video presentation followed by a 6 minute discussion by the discussants who are stalwarts in the field of cataract in india and across the globe my special thanks to steve professor chi and sergio for sparing time and joining us for this global webinar apart from all the stalwarts the panelists and the presenters thank you once again i'll request the chairman scientific committee aios dr partha biswas to take on the stage from now thank you sir thank you sonu AIOS scientific committee presents the cataract case files and it's a global webinar as sonu just said it's 28th of june today and 6 pm so welcome to the webinar and of course we have the webinar a sponsor by centus sunil ji can you play the video please mr sunil sharing my slide once again Uh, let me introduce you to my team of scientific committee at AIOS Dr Amit Porwal Dr Fairuz Dr JS Balla Dr KP Kudlu Dr Parikshit Gokte Dr Sonu Goel and Dr Somshila Murthy This big team is responsible for the big things that we do at scientific committee Let me also welcome our president AIOS Dr Mahipal Sachdev and he's on the expert panel he's chairman scientific committee irsi chairman and managing director for center for sight group of eye hospitals let me also welcome dr devashish bhattacharya founder chairman of disha eye hospitals and past president aios past president aios the expert panel also has dr d ramamurthy founder chairman of the eye foundation and past president aios as well we have dr nosy shroff medical director at bakna shroff i center we also have dr suhas aldipurkar founder of lakshmi i hospital lakshmi i institute and lakshmi charitable trust welcome sir we have with us professor jeevan singh titial professor and head cornea cataract and refractive surgery services dr rp center of ophthalmic sciences aims new delhi we have on our expert panel dr sps grewal founder and managing director of grewal eye institute chandigarh welcome sir 
We have with us Dr. Haripriya Arvin, Head of Cataract and IOL Services at Aravindai Hospital, Madurai. Currently, she's in charge of the Cataract Clinic at Aravindai Hospital, Chennai. We have with us Professor Namrata Sharma, Secretary AIOS, Professor of Ophthalmology, Cataract, Cornea and Refractive Services, RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. We have with us Dr. J.K. Reddy, Director, Shankara Eye Care, Coimbatore. And we have our two moderators, Dr. Krishna Prashad Kudlu and Dr. Sonu Goel, the anchors of this program, who have worked very, very hard to bring this program to its culmination now. And this is what we would give to them. Thank you, Sonu. Thank you, Krishna Prashad, for doing such a great job. Over to you. And I would like to invite now Dr. Namrata Sharma to give a welcome note to all our viewers, all as well as to our panelists and speakers. Dr. Namrata, please. Thank you, Partha. Uh, thank you for this uh, excellent webinar that we are doing. And congratulations to the AIOS Scientific Committee for starting this uh, case files on cases and videos. I'm sure it is going to be a great webinar. I would uh, especially like to welcome our international guests, guests Professor Chi, who's found time despite being so busy in uh, WOC, and uh, Dr. Steve Ashinov uh, from Canada, our very good friends, and of course, Dr. Sergio. At the same time, I would also like to welcome all our esteemed national faculty, uh, seniors, uh, peers, and juniors as well. And I'm sure it is going to be a great discussion. So welcome everyone. Professor um, Dr. Mahipal Singh Sajdev, sir, uh, to give the inaugural note and to inaugurate the program, sir. So you have to unmute. Thank you very much, Dr. Partha. I think, uh, as uh, we all know, we have a dynamic uh, chairman of the scientific committee, uh, Dr. Partha, and I think all the seven members of the scientific committee are par excellence, and uh, they are actually dynamos, I would say, in themselves. And uh, these case files that they have been organizing for the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, I think they have uh, been uh, greatly appreciated, and they are uh, taking us to a level where we can take pearls from each videos that are there in different subspecialities. Just to share a secret to you, Sonu, uh, we were together with uh, Professor Subak uh, at the WOC and she said that when she gets your call, she gets uh, very, very uh, nervous because you will call her again for a webinar and she wants to be excused to <laughs> more webinars uh, done by you, Sonu. So I don't know how many times you have invited her, but uh, Professor uh, Sue, I think it is really, really uh, great to have you because uh, I am a great, uh, and all of us in India are great admirers of your surgical skills. And uh, I have had the opportunity to do live surgery along with you. And uh, I know the, uh, uh, the uh, skill, the expertise and the calmness that you get into most difficult cases. So I would uh, side with Sonu and I'll keep on requesting you from behalf of various wings of AIOS to continue to give pearls to our uh, uh, ophthalmologist. Steve, uh, we have all known him. He's a great person. He, the amount of work that he has done on viscoelastics is nobody's business. And uh, welcome again, Dr. Shri Vashinov for uh, joining this. And also Sergio, I think uh, he is a great surgeon and uh, thank you very much for joining in. So I think uh, the scientific committee has put up a great show and uh, without much ado, I would wish to uh, have them start this uh, particular session and uh, uh, all the very best for a lively, wonderful uh, webinar. Over to you, Partha. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So we have our two wonderful moderators who are going to carry us through this program. So over to you, Sonu and Kudlu. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mahipal, sir, for those kind words. And I think that has reassured me that she is now more Indianized and she'll be more frequently uh, running through our webinars. So I take an affirmative note, Professor Chi and uh, Steve again, and Sergio from you all. Thank you so much. So.
So now I welcome uh, Professor Steve Arshinov. He is the associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences, the University of Toronto, Canada. His areas of research interest include ophthalmic viscosurgical devices and related surgical techniques, <laughs> phacoemulsification machine design, immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery, and of Thalmiris prophylaxis and medical outreach programs. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, 300 peer-reviewed publications and 38 medical textbook chapters and more than a thousand of the academic lectures globally. He is the designer and the medical director of the OMA CNIB, the Ontario Medical Association Canadian National Institute for the Blind, the Mobile Medical Eye Care Unit, MECU. So welcome, Steve, and he'll be delivering his keynote address on immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. I also welcome here uh, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, President AIOS, and Dr. Partha Biswas, the Chairman, Scientific Committee AIOS, to be on the panel for the keynote. All to you, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gohl, and thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this excellent symposium. Um, you can see my slide now, I hope. So I've been invited to speak about bilateral cataract surgery in a number of places now. It seems to be becoming the new normal after COVID. So I tried to change to give you a bit different talk, and hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate it. Uh, of course, I have no conflicts. Doesn't matter which eye you do. If you do one or two, it's all the same thing, whoever you consult for. Um, so uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions, everybody suddenly wants to do bilateral cataract surgery. It almost doubles the number of cases you can do per day when you have to clean your operating room and, and ventilate it for a while. And so dollars and time have become big issues in, in ophthalmology which I'd like to mention, I don't know about in India because many of you are in private practice, but in North America, it's a, it's a big difference. So uh, I was the first to study cost and reimbursement of bilateral surgery uh, because I was one of the first in the world to do it. And I was being exposed to prejudice and issues about why we do bilateral surgery. So we wrote a number of papers. And then uh, my summary of this is that, you know, it's appropriate to study comparative costing and reimbursement of doing bilateral surgery or unilateral surgery twice in different jurisdictions. I think it's not appropriate and perhaps unethical for us to choose to do unilateral or bilateral surgery because one pays us better than the other. But it is appropriate to lobby jurisdictions to fund surgery equally. So whether you choose to do bilateral or unilateral surgery based upon the specific case, you're funded fairly. So that's the brief summary of the finances. Now, so the next question comes up is, when should one consider embarking upon bilateral cataract surgery? Well, the summary briefly is when you have an extremely low complication rate. Once every step of your procedure has been perfected and you know how to dilate pupils intraoperatively as well as preoperatively, you can deal with small pupils, you understand OVDs, how to use different ones in different situations, you understand FACO machines and how you can set them better, perhaps in different situations. You, you're competent with IA doing very well. Your biometry and your IOL selection implantation are all accurate, so you're not replacing lenses. You use intracameral antibiotics always and, and you're good at it and you make sure that you seal the incisions and your surgery is more or less complication free and you have a routine of post-operative drops and follow-up that works very well. Unless you have all of those things worked out well for one eye, you probably shouldn't do two. So the next question is, well, if that's the case, why then do you perform bilateral surgery? And the answer simply is for all of us who do it, it's better for the patient and it's better for everybody else who's concerned. So I think I was the first in the world to publish a relatively large case of 1,020 consecutive bilateral surgery patients completed in 2002. And we had an extremely low complication rate, and so we were quite happy to publish it. And then just after our publication, we found that well, we weren't the only ones in the world. The Finns were probably uh, first as a country because they were adopting completely elective by patient choice bilateral cataract surgery since about 2002. 
Sweden was looking at doing bilateral surgery in 2003, and Bjorn Johansson published a smaller series than mine, roughly the same time as ours. And in Spain, the group on the Canary Islands was uh, approaching the government to try to submit a study to the government so they would approve bilateral surgery as being equally safe and effective as unilateral surgery. And it's the only country in the world where an act of parliament eventually reviewed the study and decided that bilateral surgery was equally safe and effective as unilateral surgery. So my background is that I've been doing routine bilateral surgery by patient election since 1996, probably the first in the world to do uh, them electively. And I've done about 12,000 eyes by now. And 80% of my surgeries now are bilateral surgeries. One of the things I think is very important, I use intracameral antibiotics in every case. I initially used vancomycin that I learned from Gimbel and Gills, but we stopped using that in 2003 because the government told us we had to use a generic version, which was made in Toronto and was very cheap, but unfortunately it always caused TAS. So that ruled out vancomycin. So after looking around the world for a better drug, I decided that Vigamox was probably the best. And every case since then, I've been using Vigamox and the best dose is I've decided 600 micrograms in 0.4 cc, so you can wash out the anterior chamber. We've done about 10,000 cases like that, and we've had no side effects of the drug and, and no infections at this dose. So interestingly enough, I go around the world and talk about bilateral surgery, and I thought that people weren't getting interested. But then recently I was involved in a webinar from Quebec City, which was in French, and, and the uh, chairman of the department there, Marie-Ève Ligaré, got up and said that, well, uh, after I spoke to them in 2015 or so, in 2016, they began doing bilateral cataract surgery, and they rapidly went from 6% to 22%, and now to almost 60% of their cases when the patients are given a choice. And like everyone else in the world, they found that their infection rate actually went down, and their complication rate went down. And they're now getting an infection rate of about one in 14 and a half thousand which is similar to what we showed with the International Society in reviewing 125,000 cases we did. But we weren't the first to do bilateral surgery. It turns out the first was Jacques Daviel, who in April 8, 1747, performed his first extra capsular surgery after finding out that couching didn't work very well. And he did the left eye first, which is what I do, but I didn't, don't do that because of him, it's just how our room is laid out. And by 1756, he had done about 434 cases, and he deemed about 88.5% of these to be perfectly successful, which is extremely good considering the time. So we're all following in footsteps who've gone before us. We began our society, the International Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgeons in 2008. Most of our members initially were from Spain. We had two from Britain, one Swede, one Canadian, and one South African, totally nine. There are only seven of us in the picture because one guy is taking the picture and one wasn't there. Our society has one rule. And the rule is that if you're doing bilateral surgery and you get an unresolved complication in the first eye, the second eye should be deferred. An unresolved complication is something like a broken capsule with a dropped nucleus. It doesn't mean that perhaps the capsular excess was errant, but you rescued it. That's not considered to be an unresolved complication. But we've also all discovered and believe firmly that the best time to operate on the second eye is just after gaining the experience of the first eye. And we think that's why we have such low complication rates and low infection rates because the second eye of each patient is always much easier because it's pretty much exactly the same as the first eye and you know exactly what issues you might run into. We suggest uh, that everybody follow these uh, uh, principles of safe surgery for bilateral surgery. We published this in 2000 after arguing back and forth in our society for a year. Um, and it's become a pretty much a global standard for how to do bilateral cataract surgery safely. It's available uh, on the ISBCS website or the I Foundation of Canada website, or if anybody asks me, I'll send it to you. So I began to get involved in debates and I thought that people would be angry about bilateral surgery. And then the ASCRS and ESCRS both invited me in the same year to a big debate in front of the whole audience. And I was quite surprised because in both of them, the opposition evaporated immediately. I had been to Colorado and spoken in front of Kent Syverson's group. He was my opposition for the first one. And I found out that by the time he came to the meeting, they had converted uh, about 70% to doing bilateral cataract surgery. And instead of him opposing me, he just agreed with the idea that it's much better. 
Jose Aguel in Spain was not doing bilateral surgery, but when he went through all the literature and his colleagues that were doing it and, discuss, and looked it up carefully, he found out that the only reason not to do bilateral surgery is that he felt that patients may trivialize ophthalmology and surgery if it looks so easy, which is not a good reason not to do something. And then we, I met this group that invited me to New York uh, because they have a center there and they were developing methods to do uh, small incision cataract surgery in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia, including some parts of India. And they wanted to do uh, a million uh, cataracts uh, doing uh, manual small incision cataract surgery with a kit they developed. And I went to New York and looked it over and talked to them. And they're a rather impressive group, but I really don't know how well they've done in their, in their work since then. I do know that I've been asked to speak at the Manual Small Incision Society a couple of times with these webinars. And it's interesting, uh, the excellent results that Indians particularly get with manual small incision cataract surgery. But I just thought I would suggest to you that the progression of cataract surgery really follows the same path in almost all countries. India, of course, was the first. Uh, Sushruta in about uh, 500 BC was the first person uh, or surgeon to do uh, cataract surgery. And 2000 years later, uh, Jacques Daviel went to do extra capsular surgery instead of couching. And then 200 years later, we, began, we got IRLs when Ridley plan, implanted them first with extra capsular cataract surgery. We then got a period of 25 years of intercapsular surgery, then back to extra caps and manual small incision surgery to implant lenses. And then 15 years later, FACO, and then 25 years later, FEMTO. India is now on the bridge here between ma doing manual small incision surgery in FACO with a few doing FEMTO. But I suggest that as India's economy gets better, because India, I think, has an extremely good future economically, probably better than almost any country in the world. Uh, and I think you will progress the same way as the West has and do move more and more to FACO and then to FEMTO, which will become cheaper over time and perhaps will have new things. So I think you should be interested in the new things because that's where you're going to be headed. I'd like to talk about the advantages of, of doing bilateral surgery. And my favorite one is that we can do people we wouldn't otherwise do. So I began to do amblyopic eyes in about 2000 when some patients uh, came in and they would have a narrow angle or some almost not that greatly significant reason to consider doing their amblyopic eye. And then I found out after doing 50 or 100 of these people that they see surprisingly well. And when you correct the optics of amblyopic eyes with an intraocular lens, a lot of them a year later see 20, 40, 20, 50, really quite reasonably well. And so they're not so densely amblyopic and irretrievable as we had thought. So I do them all the time now because they're lying there anyway and they might as well have the second eye done which they don't use. Uh, it's wonderful for uncooperative patients. All of these people volunteer to have their pictures. Uh, people that have psychiatric problems, Down syndromes and others, people that have like Duchenne dystrophy where you can't move them from their chair very easily and take a long time to position. I do a lot of anesthesia class four patients, patients who aren't expected to live more than five or six months, but unfortunately have cataracts sometimes from their chemotherapy and would like to be able to at least read for the last six months of their life. They're extremely grateful and they're very rewarding. They're extremely people. grateful. And, they're... Uh, and then you have people that are hard to position, which are also much easier to do both eyes at once and to do two different operations. My main suggestion is if you do bilateral surgery, be careful. Don't take anything from the first to the second eye. Read over these suggestions we have for excellence. I personally make one of these handwritten charts and put it on the microscope for every case so I know which person I'm doing, which eye I'm doing, which intraocular lens I want for that eye, and if I'm going to rotate it, the axis of astigmatism or whatever, if it's toric. And I make sure that when the circulating nurse hands the lens to the scrub nurse. She calls out which patient, which lens, which eye. The scrub nurse then announces the same thing as she gives it to me. And I look up at the microscope and make sure that it's in my handwriting that I have checked which one I'm getting. And in doing that, I have yet to make a right to left error in 12,000 or so eyes. Uh, and make sure all of your staff are aware of how to do bilateral surgery before you start doing it. Next thing I think is critical to use Intracameral antibiotics, there have been endless studies of over 10 million eyes showing how effective they are. They reduce the infection rates by a factor of about four or five. Um, and they cost very little. Even in the United States, it costs $20 per eye. 
which is by far the most expensive country in the world. In Canada, it costs about a dollar or two per eye. In India, it probably costs still less. And you save patients from losing their vision, and it just makes your life a lot easier. Beware about missed opposing bilateral surgery. People will come to you and say, well, I don't do bilateral surgery because you might get bilateral postoperative endophthalmitis. Well, we found in our society and looking at the world literature that the only cases they have had of bilateral endophthalmitis have been in patients where there was no sterility protocol followed. They, there was a serious breach of sterility. But if you don't do that, if you follow our suggestions and use antibiotics, the real risk of getting bilateral endophthalmitis simultaneously is about one to two or 300 million, which means about one patient in the world every 10 or 20 years might get bilateral endophthalmitis doing our 20 million cataracts per year around the world. And then there are all these arguments about improving the refractive result if you modify your IOL choice for the second eye. It turns out it's just not true. If you use ultrasound, it might be true, but if you use our new biometry instruments, IOL Master or LensStar, and you do topography to check the cornea, and you use one of our modern equations, it just never happens. And I haven't had to change a lens or do anything to correct anybody in the last 15 years. So it's not a reasonable worry. If you talk about bilateral surgery, please use the terminology that we've approved. And that's because I endlessly get articles to review and I can't understand what they're doing because they make up their own terminology. There are some quotes that I like, and one of them is from John Bolger, who had a course we gave at ASRS in 2008, basically reviewed the traffic accident mortality in London where he lives. And he said, when people are worried about the one in a million risk or less of getting bilateral endophthalmitis, he tells them that the risk of driving to the three extra visits in London from their home, when he judged about the average distance how far they live, the risk of dying in a car accident is three times as high as their risk of getting bilateral endophthalmitis. The difference is that endophthalmitis you can treat, death in a car accident you can't treat. And so he said, you just balance your risks in life, but you always take some risk, but it's best to have it minimal. And Olivia Lee published an article in the AJO showing that the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis is about one two thousandth the risk of dying from general anesthesia. So it's not particularly high. People weren't doing it before because they, in many jurisdictions, were getting paid more to do both eyes separately. And now they want to do it because they find they're being reimbursed better by doing both eyes together. So COVID-19 is changing perceptions, but we hope it's not for the wrong reasons. Uh, the need to wait between cases is changing attitudes. And in many places, in many jurisdictions, you can do almost double the number of cases as bilateral surgery, as unilateral surgery. And so numerous groups now are trying to go to their governments and to change the funding models to allow them to do bilateral surgery. So the rationale behind bilateral surgery really is that what we're doing is we're fixing the visual system at one sitting and not one peripheral receptor. Uh, it's better for the patient, it's better for the family, it's better for society, and the global risks of everything is, are a lot less in doing bilateral surgery rather than unilateral surgery. The documents for the ISBCS are now stored on the I Foundation of Canada. If you, so you can either go to ISBCS or I Foundation of Canada and you can find anything you want. Bilateral surgery is increasing rapidly around the world spurred by COVID-19. If you're going to do bilateral surgery, whether you do uh, extra capsular surgery or you do FACO or FEMTO, please follow the general principles of excellence, which are now accepted as a global standard. And the reasons that have been proposed not to do bilateral surgery simply have not been verifiable in any studies. Uh, the risk of endophthalmitis occurs only if you don't follow our principles and don't use antibiotics. And the need to adjust uh, the second eye IOL power just never happens if you use modern instruments. The real issue is money and COVID is changing our perceptions of what perhaps is best for the patient. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be invited as a speaker and I look forward to the rest of your session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Steve. I think a word to Dr. Maipal, sir, for his comments. Well, uh, excellent, Steve. I know that uh, you are uh, really one of the people be uh, behind promoting uh, simultaneous surgery. And uh, I think uh, Cyrus uh, Mehta uh, is also part of the group that is there. Uh, 
i have uh, really uh, the, i have really no studies to say whether uh, uh, simultaneous bilateral surgery would increase the incidence of endophthalmitis things like that but i think uh, there is a certain norm that is there and one has to actually change that norm because in today's world uh, god forbid uh, at least in india if you do something which is against a convention a settled convention and something happens to the patient that itself uh, can drag you to the consumer court and uh, it can be said that you are doing something which is against the uh, the uh, normal ethics or normal ways in which you are doing that but i am sure that as the outcomes improve uh, we are doing bilateral simultaneous surgery in uh, lasik or any refractive surgery that is there some people have started doing it in icls uh, but uh, uh, there are very few people who are doing uh, in india as things stand and there are very few proponents so i think uh, you will have to come and uh, keep on showing more evidence to uh, do that uh, the only thing is that uh, apart from uh, uh, one other thing that you mentioned which is the optical biometry etc uh, i think uh, uh, unfortunately majority of the indians don't have an optical biometer and uh, uh, because of the uh, stage in which our country is as regards development lot of us are uh, still uh, using the immersion or the a scan uh, as things stand so therefore uh, the surprises uh, could be a little more and uh, uh, there are instances uh, especially in the camp settings or in uh, high volume uh, centers where off and on we get uh, uh, these examples of 8 eyes 12 eyes 16 eyes or 20 eyes uh, getting uh, end of thalmitis still so i think uh, uh, until of course one is very very sure that all the equipments are getting changed uh, one is very very sure about the sterility of the whole thing one is very very sure about the outcomes of one surgery and uh, one is very sure about the iol power calculations and how the patient is likely to behave with those iol power calculations uh, it will be uh, i think a slow and a gradual process in india but i think uh, very well uh, articulated uh, scientifically supported uh, talk that you have given and uh, we'll have uh, people discuss it out on the panel uh, uh, i don't know if anybody else in the panel or among the scientific committee members are actually doing the bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery thank you for an excellent talk quick Dr. question from the audience sorry a quick question from the audience will you do a multifocal or a trifocal as a bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery dr steve actually i will only do them as bilateral surgery because when you do them as unilateral surgery they notice difference in contrast in their two eyes and they complain when you do them together and the patients have you know imperfect vision before which is why you're doing surgery they are really extremely happy and whatever you plan uh, whether you plan both the multifocals to have the same focal points or a bit of mono vision with them so you have uh, more progression they are really very accepting of the result much better so i actually will only do them as bilateral surgery So no, so one of the ophthalmologists who is doing bilateral surgery, Dr. Bharti in Delhi, he does it only for the trifocals uh, or the bifocals, and that's exactly the reason what Steve is saying that uh, he doesn't want to expose them to two, two different types. <clears throat> one of the indications where he's doing uh, together is uh, for uh, these uh, premium IOLs. Can I? Can you can see by summation, right? I think Dr. Vision in two eyes. The summation, so you see better with two eyes. Uh, uh thank you steve that was an excellent presentation and uh, i am on the same board as you are and uh, for last many many years uh, i have been doing the same simultaneous in multifocal lenses i have presented at some forum also but i get the same kind of a criticism and these are the two main points that you are said and you have rightly said that once you have standardized your procedures and your protocols for biometry and your protocols for operation theater are standardized and followed i don't think there should be any hesitation in going ahead with and thank you so much for a great presentation thank you for your comments i love your red turban <laughs> thank you i just thank you very much to, uh, i just had a comment to make i think it yes. makes a lot of sense now especially for pediatric cataracts who have total cataracts and you have ga coupled with general anesthesia so if you do them bilaterally maybe that that time is also decreased especially that, in the corona uh, times i think uh, uh, can i can make yeah 
uh, I uh, thank you so much for you know basically opening up a subject that uh, is uh, at a particular time controversial, but not really so because you have shown world literature, you have shown your own uh, experience as well as uh, the experience of so many other places, other countries who have developed uh, the sequential bilateral cataract surgery. And it is a lot of food for thought for our own country. Apart from uh, what uh, Dr. Grewal said, uh, the important cases of the uh, multifocals or the trifocals or what Namrata said about the uh, cases of the pediatric cataract, we in India used to have a huge backlog of needless blindness because of cataract. And that is one huge segment that uh, possibly we should ad address. Now, going by the parameters of the sterility, the procedure, and the infection rate, I think uppermost in everybody's mind is the infection possibility which deters a surgeon from a bilateral cataract surgery. What happens if? And that if is what deters us specifically. However, as the results mount uh, to show that uh, cataract surgery has become safer and safer and uh, the world literature as well as Dr. Haripriya's uh, literature from our own country, which showed that the number of endophthalmitis post cataract surgery has gone down dramatically because of the use of uh, intracameral moxifloxacin, and most of us are using intracameral moxifloxacin routinely. So here we definitely need in our country a study that shows whether bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery is the way to go for our cases, which uh, are, uh, are our charitable cases, the ones who cannot pay and for whom we uh, actually cross subsidize in our hospitals. So that is the segment with uh, what India should be looking at. And here I'd like to ask Dr. Haripriya if you would like to comment on it, because since Aravindai hospitals do a huge uh, number of charitable cases, and what is your uh, take on a bilateral sequential cataract surgery in the socioeconomic so Again, uh, thank you, uh, Steve. The second time I'm listening to your talk, the first time was at the ophthalmology summit last year. And uh, I think after your talk, we have uh, more reasons to believe in performing uh, immediately bilateral, immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Uh, so actually, we have not been doing it routinely. Uh, we do do it in uh, people who have psychiatric illness and who need it under GA. But besides that, we haven't uh, done it. Uh, and like you mentioned, probably this pandemic is one reason we may have to consider, at least for some patients, because we're seeing many more patients with advanced cataracts now. So over the last three, four months, we haven't been doing many surgeries. So we have patients with bilateral mature cataracts. So this probably is a good time, at least to start off with those patients. And like was mentioned, maybe it was not for everyone, but if we can choose those patients wisely, uh, especially if they have advanced cataracts in both eyes or both eyes require premium myoles, I think they would be the first uh, group I would consider rather than the patients who are coming from the camps uh, and things because uh, as was mentioned, uh, with our you know, optical biometers and stuff, the refractive outcomes have been so good. Uh, we find that, uh, you know, we, we never actually adjust the second eye's power based on the first eye because the outcomes are very good today. Except for a, a research purpose, we don't actually adjust the second eye unless you have one or two cases uh, where you have some significant uh, errors. So that makes sense. We also saw that amongst our data, we looked at last seven years as data to look at timing between both eyes of surgery. It was uh, about 300 days. So that was a long time that the patients were only having uniocular vision. So much more higher chance of uh, anisometropia they are, in terms of safety, the, the quality of living. So I think somewhere uh, either bilateral simultaneous or even if it's delayed uh, bilateral, at least to do it with a less difference, more consciously, I think is something we have to consider. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you. Uh, can I make a comment? Um, what I've observed being on the outside is, you know, most of us who give lectures around the world, we go all over the place. So you see how different countries are doing. And uh, I think that if I had to be positive on the economy of one country, it would be it. India. Um, I, I think that you guys have come amazingly long way since I first went there in the early 1990s. 
And I think you will have continued enhanced success. And I think things like the camps will slowly disappear as, as the India becomes gradually more affluent. And you also will find that the money that you save by bringing someone in from far away and doing both eyes together can then be spent on something else you're doing in bilateral surgery, like paying for an IOL master when you'd be doing thousands of cases anyway, so the per patient cost is not very high. Um, you'll find that gradually, gradually you move to those things and, and the cost uh, will become irrelevant and the, and the CAM patients will disappear. They'll be poor, but they'll pay a little bit to help cover their costs. And so I think like in other countries that have found the same thing, you will gradually move in that direction. The same as I think that you will slowly move from manual small incision to FACO and FEMTO as India becomes a more affluent country. Um, and I, I, you have the youngest population that's educated in the world. Uh, you have a very dynamic country. You know, in Canada, we have something like 23 places that teach ophthalmology. And I think in India, you have 1,640 or something. It just boggles the mind for a Canadian to come to India and see how many wonderful surgeons and great ideas you have. If you go to any meeting in the world, most of the new ideas and new videos come from India. So I, I can only be extremely bullish on the prognosis of how well you guys will do. And I don't think claiming poverty will last very long. I, I think you will find that that just disappears and you will have success upon success upon success. And I just love coming to India. I think it's a great country. You guys do wonderful work and I'm really honored to take part in your meeting. Sometimes I wonder why you ask me because you have so many fantastic Indian surgeons and so many fantastic universities. Why well, have a little guy from Canada, from Canada where we have no universities compared to you and very little research compared to you? I think we are so waiting thank you for very much. When, uh, when you guys start calling Indians and then we don't need to call you back. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Actually, Steve, I debated against you in a WOC debate just day before yesterday. And yes. I spoke... Uh, for delayed uh, sequential bilateral cataract surgery. So quite a few points are still fresh in my mind. Of course, you have very strictly laid down criteria, but once in a while, I, I know there are only six cases of uh, bilateral endophthalmitis that have occurred, but all of these been, have been reported, uh, reported by the secondary centers where the patient went for treatment. So obviously, just because this is the incidence, uh, this is what has been reported, we cannot consider that that is all the incidence of uh, bilateral endophthalmitis, which is obviously be a disaster. Apart from that, bilateral tasks, bilateral macular problems, which have gone undetected. And once in a while, still we come across cluster infections in camps in our setup. Obviously, that would be a disaster if both eyes have been operated. And as regards uh, um, uh, premium intraocular lenses, even though we, we hit the target most often with present day formulae and instruments that is available, even if we hit the target in the first time, very often I titrate the power, the type of lens that I put in, micro monovision, monovision, et cetera, depending upon the comfort level of the vision that has been achieved in the first time. And uh, bilaterally implanted, I find that I'm able to achieve much better results when I give a two week gap and uh, uh, titrate the kind of power that I'm implanting in the second eye. It's not a mistaken biometry, but learning from the first eye to implant in the second eye. So basically a great talk. I've listened to this before, but uh, just uh, uh, giving a contrarian view to uh, just uh, round it off. Well, thank you. I don't in disagree entirely with your concerns, but I can tell you that all of us who do bilateral surgery went through similar concerns. But I'll tell you with confidence that as you do more and more bilaterals, you'll find that your views change because they, they do extremely well. As long as you're careful, the risk of infection is negligible and the chances of errors uh, become less and less as you use modern machines and uh, you use topography to check out the corneas or tomography to check out the posterior surface as well, you find that you, you just don't have those mistakes. And the patients almost invariably are seeing 20-20 post-op and with a multifocal they can read or trifocal, and they're quite happy. They see better with two eyes than with one. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you for the wonderful discussion. I know you have two more webinars to attend today, so we won't hold you on, but we'll definitely have you for more debates in India. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure as always. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for accepting our invite. Thank you so much. Right. So as right. we move the on now... the webinar.
I'll take this opportunity to invite the next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Professor Rajesh Sena. He's Professor of Ophthalmology in Cornea Lens and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center, Ames, Delhi. And he's a prolific writer with uh, 300 and close to 350 publications, three textbooks, and four educational manuals to his name. He's been a part of three multicentric FDA clinical trials and has received achievement awards at American Academy, Asia Pacific Academy, and SARC Academy of Ophthalmology. Delivered many notable orations in the country. He's an excellent surgeon, wonderful human being, and a very close friend. Over to you, Professor Rajesh Sena. Thank you. Uh... So the panel, uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma, I invite uh, Dr. Haripri and Dr. Namrata to please panel uh, this debate at this talk. Thank you, Dr. Partha and Dr. Sonu, and uh, I'm extremely thankful to both of you for uh, inviting me in this webinar. I'll be talking about uh, managing cataracts and uh, hazy corneas. And uh, the biggest problem with hazy corneas is the issue of visibility. Uh, just hold on. Is the issue of visibility because the cornea is hazy and uh, uh, a surgeon wants a clear visibility for proper cataract surgery. So the aim of uh, doing the surgery in these cases and the aim of presentation is to enhance visualization in, uh, and try to find out ways how to enhance visualization. And one of the important ways is to use tap in blue dye for a slightly longer period in these cases so that you can stain the anterior capsule well. And while you are doing a capsular excess, you have an opacity here in this area. So you should be careful that you don't leave the capsular flap somewhere behind this. You should leave it behind a clear cornea so that you can hold it properly and create a nice uh, circular uh, capsular excess. And a good hydro procedure and rotation is very essential because uh, it is only partly visible. So you need to do that carefully. And by chopping technique, you can uh, complete the uh, nuclear emulsification. And once you have done the nuclear emulsification, while you're doing cortical aspiration, you should ensure that the tip of the irrigation aspiration probe should always be visible so that there's no, you don't damage the capsule accidentally. And if you catch it, it will be difficult to leave it. Now, use of viscoelastic on the cornea many times help, helps in increasing visualization in many cases. So is the case with the use of endoilluminators, which uh, really you know, improves visualization while you are chopping and while you are emulsifying these nucleus pieces. And once you've emulsified the nucleus, to hold the EP nucleus, the margin of the EP nucleus, you can take the endoeliminator inside, you can very nicely see the margin of the EP nucleus while you're holding, and then you can bring it in the center and uh, emulsify it and uh, completely aspirate it. So uh, these endoeliminators are really very useful in performing uh, procedures. Again, chandelier elimination is another good technique will, uh, in hazy corneas, which will give you a nice red glow and you can go ahead and do a capsular excess and uh, the other steps of echomalsification. Sometimes you have a very hazy cornea like this. In that case, you would like to do uh, anterior lambda keratectomy. You would like if the opacity or the haze is in the anterior corneal stroma, then you would like to do an anterior keratectomy. And once you do it, many times you see that the cornea clears up pretty nicely. And uh, you can go ahead and perform the cataract procedure in all sorts of uh, cataracts because the visibility has improved quite significantly. Once you have done the you are done with the cataract procedure, you can replace the uh, the the keratectomy keratectomized uh, cornea like uh, if uh, with whatever thickness you have removed. So if you have removed the thickness of 150 microns, you don't need to put a suture. But if you have removed the thickness of more than 200 microns, then you need sutures. Now, in cases wherein you have a central corneal opacity like this, even a pupil of five to six millimeter is not good uh, because you can see only from the peripheral part. So it is essential to enlarge the pupil further to nine or 10 millimeters by use of uh, iris hooks. And sometimes you can do an eccentric crater, Dr. Namta, one of the panelists who, who you know, uh, gave this idea of, and we have a paper also which we are sending of doing an eccentric crater and, and chopping. So in such cases, if you have a central corneal opacity, after completing the procedure, as you can see in this case, you can do a small sphincterotomy. Professor Detail knows this. We had uh, published this uh, article. 
So we, you can do a small sphincterotomy and that gives a nice uh, visual outcome in uh, the patient for a long term, on a long term basis. So a case of corneal opacity, something like this, you and one eyed individual, vascularized opacity, risk of graft rejection is there. Procedure. You can do a cataract surgery by enhancing visualization safely and maybe a little a small pupillary sphincterotomy to provide a long-term, reasonably good visual outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for a wonderful uh, presentation. I think uh, Namrata Madam is here. I think uh, you are mentioning her that she is the person, I think, done a lot of uh, surgeries with the uh, easy cornea. Madam, uh, your opinion. I think it was an excellent presentation, Rajesh. You showed virtually everything in such difficult cases to handle. So uh, the question I think that uh, generally comes to our mind is how do you calculate IOL power in such cases? So would you just uh, throw a light on that? Uh, uh, you can use if the patient is uh, uh, the other eye is fine, then you can use the cornea of the other eye to calculate the keratometry and the axial length of that same eye. So that way we can have uh, IOL power calculation. If the patient is one eye, then in that case maybe a standard K can be taken and. Uh, I think a question which comes to every FACO surgeon, not cornea surgeon, I'm saying essentially a FACO surgeon is when you encounter a case of Fuchs dystrophy with cataract, then what is your cutoff for the endothelial cells, uh, you know, to be uh, whether you will just continue with FACO alone or you'll think of a transplant? Yeah, uh, this is uh, definitely a tricky situation, but uh, if the cornea is clear and the uh, endothelial cell count is more than 1,000, per square millimeter and uh, the corneal thickness, central corneal thickness is less than 640 microns. Then in that case, it is advocated that you should go ahead and do a cataract surgery first and then see uh, uh, in subsequent follow-up whether the patient requires uh, endothelial keratoplasty. Now, only thing is that if the pay, if you have, but, but if the values are on the other side, like if the endothelial cell count is less than 1,000, thickness is more than 640 microns, in that case, a combined procedure uh, is considered as a better in terms of providing good visual rehabilitation. Now, the only thing is, if you are doing a DSEC procedure, planning a DSEC procedure, then there is a risk of hyperopic uh, change in these patients. So, if you're planning that, then you should err for, if you're doing a cataract surgery first, then you should err for a slightly myopic target refraction, something between 1.25 to 1.5 diopters, so that subsequently, uh, if you have done a DSEC, then uh, the, the, the hyperopic surprise is neutralized by the myopic uh, target refraction that you have taken. But uh, in DMEC, if you're doing a DMEC and regularly do it, and you're sure that you can do it, then uh, you, may, you may just go ahead with an emetropic part. Hari Priya, madam, uh, I think you might have been doing the similar type of surgeries in your place also, or in the hospital. But I was very impressed with the Rajesh presentation on the chandelier illumination. So I just want Dr. Hari Priya's opinion. Will you follow the same technique or will you do a, some other technique or you do like endo probe uh, illumination what Rajesh showed? I haven't used the uh, illuminator, but uh, I think Dr. Rajesh's video was very comprehensive. So he covered all the options uh, of how you know, different options of dealing with this. So what I would do is I would try to maximize the visibility. Uh, obviously, we have access to good microscopes. We obviously will try to go with the red reflex mode uh, to do the capsular excess. I'd also tilt the eye so there is more uh, illumination in the eye. So try to see through the clear con the clearer part of the cornea where it is possible. Uh, again, the pupil size also matters, like Dr. Rajesh showed, using the iris looks, because once the pupil is smaller, the red reflex goes down significantly. So, so to enhance that, you may even consider using some uh, rings or uh, hooks, so you have your larger pupil. So these are the different uh, tips I would uh, use when dealing with eyes with uh, hazy corneas. I think uh, one more uh, point which we can discuss, and that is, you know, you should do FACO in situ. One, what happens is if you have a very hard cataract or a white cataract with the corneal haze and you don't have a retromal illumination on, then it can get a little bit tricky. So in all those cases, when you start the case, you put your retro illumination on. I mean, ensure that it is on. Two is that FACO in situ. That means as you, as you uh, chop each, chop each, so that the orange glow gets better and better, you know, and it, 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 it becomes clearer 
as the orange glow gets better. So FACO in C2 is important rather than leaving the chalk pieces there only because with the passage of just eating away the nuclear fragments, the orange glow becomes white, expands and gets wider and the rest of the things become clearer. Another factor is also with the capsular excess, I would uh, like not to start or end at the site where you have the opacity, away from it, because once you complete, you're sure that way that you have a complete capsular excess. So I'd like to uh, pass under the uh, hazy cornea somewhere midway. That would what, That's something I would consider. Did you also wanted to comment, I believe? Yeah, just uh, two comments in this. Uh, cases with corneal opacity or corneal scars or hazy cornea, where we are going to do cataract surgery to improve their vision, should be those cases where you have opacity little paracentral or they are not in the visual axis significant one. If you have a large opacity in a visual axis, whatever you do, you are not going to improve vision significantly in a post-op for these patients. So I, I would consider those patients where central area is relatively clear or they have a nebular macular opacities where your characterometry can be done nicely and you have a good IL power calculation. In fact, I had written a you know, little bit on this also. If you have a larger opacity, one-eyed patient where you have uh, keratoplasty may not be a feasible option. In those cases, to avoid the major complications, suppose you're doing FACO in these cases and you have a nucleus drop, the things become tough. Though I think nowadays we have an endoscopic surgery, you can still do a good beta retina surgery. In such cases, SICA surgery may, may be more safer. That will not have a more chance of the nucleus drop in such cases. And, and Rajesh uh, covered most of the thing, but I think the endothelial protection in such cases are much more important. In, you, you, you're going to have more damage in these cases because surgery is going to be uh, much difficult. So what uh, Steve was there in the beginning, uh, his technique of soft shell techniques would be used in these cases, not uh, in the beginning also, and maybe in between also when you have difficulty. So I would consider, uh, people should consider what they are going to achieve after surgery and take those cases where vision is going to improve. Otherwise, uh, if it, bilateral cases, I would never uh, uh, take them for a simple cataract surgery, maybe plan for a triple procedure in, if you have a larger opacity in the center. Uh, using all those devices to improve visibility may work out, but if you have a significant opacity, I think Namata will, will also agree sometimes lamellar procedures can be done in these cases to have a better you know, visualization and subsequent optical clarity. So, uh, Bartha, can I make a point? Uh, Bartha? Sure, sir. Please, sure, sir. So, actually, again, the same discussion as we did with uh, Steve, it depends upon where you are uh, what kind of equipment you have and what kind of expertise you have. So it is obviously going to be dependent on the availability of the corneas and it is also going to be dependent on the outcomes that you are getting uh, with a graft. Now, sometimes uh, the corneal opacities can deceive you a lot, uh, both in the form of uh, nebulomacular corneal opacities, uh, us thinking that they will not get good vision. Uh, but uh, patients at times become very, very happy. The second thing that we need to see is that in case we have superficial nebulomacular corneal opacities, uh, on the skill sets, the academics, the, the surface ablation uh, is something that can be done as a PTK mode to kind of smoothen out those, uh, which is uh, possibly uh, more predictable than a graft. And the third thing is that what Rajesh was saying, I fully agree with the, him that there are these uh, parameters that uh, you would want to have a cell count uh, of 1000 and uh, 640 being the cutoff. But uh, again, there are several times pleasant surprises that you get. I have operated on patients with counts of 600, 700. It is not just the count which matters, but it also depends on the structural, apart from that, the functional functionality of the cells that are remaining. So often in young individuals uh, with even lower count, uh, they have uh, performed well. I still, uh, there's a patient under active follow-up who's a, 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 a magistrate uh, in one of the Delhi courts. And uh, I told him that uh, we will go in for a combined because his cell counts were almost like 500, 600. And uh, the chief judicial magistrate, he said, he said, no, no, I'm very afraid. I don't want to get a, a DSEC with a, a cataract. And to my surprise, uh, the patient is having 6'6 vision. And uh, this is uh, almost one year uh, uh, post the surgery that, uh, and he's uh, uh, giving judgments and he's very active on that. 
so what i'm just trying to say is that at times you do get deceived by what your count is showing on the specular because it may not be totally aligned to the functionality of the endothelial cells so may or may not be a bad idea to give it a shot of doing a cataract surgery first and uh, if the cornea decompensates obviously the patient is prepared and uh, in a short interval maybe a couple of weeks or uh, months uh, you could go ahead and do a uh, a graft for uh, these patients a laminar graft so cornea at times is deceptive both in superficial opacities as also in endothelial cell count completely agreed sir actually these are just uh, guidelines but uh, there are many cases wherein you know uh, things behave differently and it's always uh, you know practically better that you know in such cases like cases of fugues we do cataract surgery first and then see how it behaves and then go ahead with the I think wonderful points by Dr. Mahipal and thank you Dr. Rajesh for that wonderful presentation. I think a single video gave all the teaching pearls. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So next we have Dr. Gaurav Luthra. I don't think he needs any introduction. The face of AIOS. So let's hear from Dr. Parikshit. Dr. Parikshit. Yeah. As you rightly said, Dr. Sono, Dr. Gaurav Luthra needs no introduction. One of the most popular figures in AIOS, he has been the chairman of ARC for IIRSI, and of course the backbone of the Uttarakhand State Ophthalmological Society. And he's done a lot of phenomenal work in the Dehradun Drishti Eye Institute, and he has been member of both the ARC and the scientific committee of AIOS. But more than that. He's known as a dear friend and a mentor to so many of us. To Dr. Gaurav sir. Uh, thank so, you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Sonu and uh, Dr. Parikshit. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can, sir. Okay. Or just I'll introduce Dr. Chetial as the panel and Dr. Sure, Devishi. Sure. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invite. All to you, Gaurav. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, uh, I'm grateful to AIOS and uh, the AIOS Scientific Committee and the chairman for, you know, inviting me for uh, this, uh, you know, prestigious webinar. And I've been enjoying all the excellent lectures so far and will continue to enjoy them. I'll quickly share my screen. Uh, all right. I was asked to speak on uh, intumescent cataracts. It's mostly going to be video based and we all are dealing with uh, this, all of us, I think, and... Uh, most uh, cataract surgeons uh, actually have this, uh, you know, challenge of the intumescent cataract. So the challenges with the intumescent cataract could be many. Um, at the outset, shallow AC, uh, high intral ventricular pressure. Uh, they could be upthrust sometimes in these cases, uh, especially glaucoma patients as well. Runaway rexis is always a risk that you're always scared of. So you're trying to make sure that you don't have one. Uh, sometimes you can have uh, the rexis uh, redundant tag prolapse to the incision, and that can be a challenge. And with the escaping viscoelastic, they can be a flag sign. So several, uh, you know, in, innovations have been made or whatever. I mean, people have uh, gone through the, you know, so many ways of managing these intumescent cataracts. Uh, you know, we use uh, uh, ample use of viscoelastic, of the correct viscoelastic, the soft shell technique, yagging the entire capsule. I was uh, listening to this yesterday in one of the webinars. I added it here. I personally don't do that. Uh, decompressing the lens, which I think many of us are doing now in different ways. A small quick rexis followed by aspirating a little bit and then enlarging the rexis. Uh, Pancho rexis as uh, popularized by Dr. Mohan, but uh, much before that, even by uh, Uday Devgan and so many others. A spiral rexis, which again is a wonderful technique and I'll be showing one of those. A zepto can be used and even the femto assisted, which has probably become a very popular way of managing intumescent for those who actually own one. So these are so many ways that we can tackle it. I wanted to start by this one video. Uh, as you can see, I do use a Rexus marker and then I stain it with a Trypan Blue. Now here uh, we were managing an intumescent. We didn't anticipate that this would uh, cause problems uh, in our estimation. So we are going with the conventional way of doing our Rexus. Otherwise I would normally follow a different way. But you can see that suddenly now there is this beginning of an extension. So I quickly go from the side port, try to aspirate, but just watch what happens. And this is the reason why I wanted to show this video. Sometimes if you're trying to decompress, if you suddenly aspirate, it can catch the capsule and the rexus uh, tear can actually extend. So this can cause problems and uh, then you can of course uh, try to manage it, but if it runs away completely, then you're in a soup. So when using all these aspiration techniques for decompressing the lens, one has to be very careful that use a very fine cannula and make sure that you don't get uh, caught with uh, the capsule doesn't get caught or sudden decompression doesn't happen. 
Now, another situation where, uh, you know, we are doing dealing with the intumescent cataract and uh, uh, this didn't appear again to be a problem, but as we reach near the main port and you can see here that uh, suddenly the viscoelastic escapes and the flap tends to come out. And I'm sure some of us have held this problem and it can be dangerous because it can cause a runaway of the rexis. So at this point, you have to be very, very careful. You can uh, manage this uh, redundant flap uh, carefully, push it back, uh, or you can snip it if you have uh, some kind of uh, you know good scissors which can go through and push put in more viscoelastic to let it go back. Sometimes putting in viscoelastic can be con you know counterintuitive because it can actually bring the flap further out. So you have to be very, very careful that you don't uh, let this run away. And then once you manage it, of course, you can go back and finish the rexis and it's not difficult to manage, but this does require care. And uh, now, you know, in spite of all these things, when you have an intumescent cataract, sometimes, you know, you are fearing that the moment your rexis is, you know, you're fearing that uh, it can go into a flag sign, which uh, sometimes it does in spite of all your best efforts. And then, you know, you have to kind of uh, make sure that you manage it adequately. And uh, uh, one way which I talked about initially and which is one of my favorites as well, is to of course you can you know aspirate and do that but a, a spiral rexus making a smaller rexus first and then uh, this is a slightly fast forward video so please excuse that you know it looks fast but you have to do it very carefully and gently and slowly and uh, you can first make a slightly smaller rexus like that and then you can go and actually once you've completed one round of the rexus, a small one, a frill of rexus can be, you can keep doing it and it will never run away. So this is one thing I've learned over the so many years that I've been doing these uh, patients that even pediatric cataract with intumescent lenses, if you have that small frill, it is never going to run away and you can take three, four, five rounds as many as you want. So you can see here that I've almost completed maybe two or three rounds and yet, you know, uh, it has given me the adequate size rexus. So what I currently do, is this, uh, you know, stain the capsule, put viscoelastic. Uh, you, I, you try to use viscoat because it works well for me. I've done the soft shell and everything else. Dr. Arshinov is here and we'll take his comments on that. But once I've done that, you'll notice that I'm not going through the main port, but I'm going through a separate new paracentesis uh, to decompress the lens. And let me just show you how it works. So stain it. And uh, once you've stained it, we will, you know, Make sure that we have adequate viscoelastic there. And uh, you can see that this is an intermittent brown cat. Right now, making sure that all ports are sealed. So my side ports, my main port, everything is sealed. So that the chamber cannot be lost. So I'm making, taking a 26 or a 30 gauge needle from the new port. There is no chance of deep compression or leakage. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm just decompressing and aspirating. Now you can either go bevel down or bevel up as is your comfort, but you have to be sure that you don't catch the capsule uh, and you know do it gently. And once you've decompressed the lens, you can obviously complete the rexus uh, very easily. And uh, this is what I prefer to do today. But let me show you the challenges uh, with this as well. And uh, here again, we are doing this decompression and aspirating. And you can see that it aspiration worked. Then I thought that it needs a little more decompression, went in from the side port and did a little more, making sure that viscoelastic is replaced each time. And then you can do a quick small rexus because here I felt that, you know, the mid periphery was still intumescent enough that I was worried that it might run out. So here again, you know, I went with the spiral technique and believe me, this really works well. So all, uh, all those who are listening in, uh, you know, whenever you're in a situation like this, make a small rexus and then, you know, you can make a bigger one. And if it just completes as a small rexus, don't hesitate to give a small snip on it and then uh, make it larger and make it adequate because see this is a brown cataract if you have a small rexus to deal with you're going to have problems cracking the nucleus so please don't settle for a small rexus if it completes accidentally then please go around and snip it and then make a bigger rexus and it works quite well now sometimes these things don't work and you can see here that there is a situation where this was a very intumescent cataract we went in with the technique that i prefer to use now and uh, i aspirated it I'm so sorry, yeah. in spite of all the experience with the webinars, I'm still making these mistakes. Um, so here it aspirated a little bit, decompressed, but see what happened. The moment I went in, now you can see that, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just entering to inject Visco and this has started running away. So even the slightest decompression can cause problems and uh, you have to be very, very careful that the chamber remains stable at all times. And then, you know, I'm just using the cannula to just reflect that small flap. And then of course you can complete it. So these are the situations, but now just watch what happens. I was very nice and happy after giving one oration on intumescent cataracts. I thought I've achieved it all. And I said in that oration that in 300 cataracts now with this technique, I've never had a flag sign. And when I came back first OT, 
I had this patient just watch what happens. I have done everything right so far, and I'm going in to, you know, make the decompression. And uh, once I, you know, manage to go in, just watch. I'm in now, and I'm just going to start aspirating. And as I start aspirating, I, I just touch the lens there. Just watch. I just touch it. and before even i have time to do anything you know, so sometimes if you've done everything right in spite of that sometimes you this will happen now what is the key the key is to do an oct pre op i now i've started doing oct for all my intubus and cataract and if you see these clear fluid spaces just behind the capsule you have to be fully prepared second thing you should be looking at is the ac depth and the lens thickness so if you can look at this if you have an ad of like less than 2 mm you have to be extremely careful you can look at the convexity of the lens and you can look at the lens thickness if it's more than 5 5.5 these are situations so today i do um, fm to assisted surgery i'll just show you quickly in, and then we'll finish uh, once you do the yeah i'll just finish in, in 30 seconds i won't show you details of the surgery so all i wanted to show was that in a femto which is currently my favorite technique for those who can who have access to a femto it is uh, very good to uh, be able to do this and you can pick up the intubus and cataracts you can pick up the ac depth and uh, then you can you know still get away with uh, a good surgery you can see that just watch the mushroom as the laser fires you'll be able to appreciate what happens in an intubus just see how that explosion takes place and yes i would like to just point out i'll conclude that femto is not fail proof i still managed to occasionally get tags in the end of the surgery and i also managed to get sometimes a broken rexus but the percentages are really 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 small so the take home message is that please if you have access to an oct please do an as oct please make sure that you are watching the ac depth and ensuring that the convexity of the lens is under watch use viscoelastics correctly make sure that your chamber remains stable all the time decompress the lens from a separate port rather not from the main port or the side port have good control good instruments good micro rexus forceps go only from the side port and if possible if you have access to a femto or something uh, that would be a great idea as well thank you so much thank you gaurav for a wonderful presentation i think uh, we have here professor tithyal i think i still remember he has been showing the intumation cataract with the help of uh, oct guided system who is excessively in rp center i think we want sir's opinion regarding the intumation cataract management Uh, first of all, uh, Gaurav, uh, wonderful presentation, uh, classical uh, videos, a uh, lot of uh, teaching tips. I think there are a few things are important uh, in the white character. First is your analysis of morphology or type of white character which you are going to tackle, which uh, Gaurav talked about anti-segment OCT. The careful straight line examination, anti-segment OCT, which uh, will delineate what type of white character you are facing with. So if you have a, uh, as I showed in the OCT, if you have a, a anterior capsule and there's a space between the anterior capsule, uh, there's a uh, homogeneous uh, space. Those cases will be, you know, amenable to your puncture because you have to decide. There are two ways to decrease the internal ventricular pressure, raised ventricular. One is puncture aspiration. Second is doing a small opening, a small rexus, then aspiration. So these two ways you can decrease the internal ventricular pressure in these cases. So I would say those cases where you have a lot of space between anterior capsule and the hydrated cortex, that means you have a fluid in between. Aspiration with the needle can safeguard these cases. If you have a continuous sheet of hydrated cortex and you have an intra uh, 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 laminal uh, fluid pocket, those cases you may not be able to aspirate. Their pressure may not decrease. Those cases we should do a small rexus then aspirate. So this is the morphology pre-op can give you. Second important thing is the viscoelastic which you are going to inject into these cases. I normally do a, a combination viscoelastic, which is a reverse Arsenoff technique. First, I use a coarse viscoelastic that is one percent sodium halogenate. Make a, a, a chamber uniform. Over that, I inject a dispersive viscoelastic so that it maintains the coarse viscoelastic tamponade onto the anterior capsule. When you are doing a neck, there is no sudden decrease in the pressure, and you don't have a extension or tear happening. These things, so you you can easily manipulate the uh, capsule with the one percent sodium halogen in these cases. And third important thing is uh, do as as you nicely so do a small rexus, decrease the pressure, then do a spiraling technique that works wonderfully in these cases. Even after you complete your nephrotomy, if your rexus seems slightly smaller as per the IUL size, you can again redo the you know customization of rexus. After you complete the uh, nephrotomy, also the same thing. Yesterday I talked about the uh, same thing in the WOC. Also, the question is to check your pre-op morphology or your cataract, white cataract. Then visualize what type of uh, difficulty you're going to face. 
then implement that in, in on the table. You don't require I, I city for all the cases, but if you have, that can give you a much more dynamics of what, how much flattening or entry capsule happening after you make a nick, what happens to the peripheral cortex. Other important thing, which we uh, nicely showed by Dr. Gaurav, if you have a tear seem to extending to periphery, don't jerk at that time. Slowly take out your uh, needle or a uh, capsulotomy forceps. Then try to inject the uh, dispersive viscoelastic from periphery to center so that the tear doesn't go periphery. So give a pressure from periphery so you tamponade that area which is going to tear out. And that will decrease the tear extension immediately. One or, one or two cases I could, you know, uh, prevent the uh, adjunct flag also. I, as soon as I saw that tear is going to uh, elliptical shape, I made a cruciate uh, incision. That means four incision into a cross one. The uh, pressure changes to four direction. That also decreases the pressure. Give some time for uh, making a smaller opening. So I would say if you understand cases pre-operatively nicely, you can manage uh, in an intra-op phase also. But beautiful videos, uh, Gaurav. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Grateful. From the master, if I hear it, I, it really makes my day, sir. Thank you. Dr. Devashi, sir, any you, your comments on the intermersion and cataract? Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, Gaurav made a wonderful presentation and uh, was followed excellently by uh, Professor TPR's remarks. Uh, I also uh, uh, prefer the reverse, uh, you know, uh, Option of technique, I use a uh, heavy viscoelastic, uh, maybe helon, and then go with the visco dispersive visco. And uh, the, uh, the point of interest is the infralenticular pressure uh, factor has to be more neutralized in the periphery. So I generally top the periphery more with the dispersive viscoelastic. So that is one thing I would like to share here. And uh, the other thing which we were talking about is uh, uh, basically uh, the where the entire lens is hydrated and the chamber shallow and the lens thickness beyond uh, five millimeter. So here the other option would I would definitely consider is to debulk through a pars planar uh, vitrectomy. So, you know, that makes uh, things much more easier, especially if we are doing some kind of, uh, you know, uh, premium IOL. And uh, the other thing is uh, how to retrieve back a uh, rexis when it has gone peripherally. One is, as of course, uh, uh, TTL said, that uh, slowly re reconstruct the chamber from the periphery to the center with a uh, dispersive viscoelastic. And then, uh, you know, generally we try to continue or retrieve the rexis back uh, uh, in the direction of the rexis, but uh, I think it's better thought that we uh, retrieve it towards the center and in the opposite direction, but because the pull uh, is already there, I think uh, this has become quite a standard technique now. And of course, in intumescent cataracts, we also knew have to follow certain rules about uh, the nuclear management because of, of often you would have a uh, sclerotic uh, uh, small nucleus after the rexus has been done. So we need to uh, hold it at one part and uh, see how well we can chop it. And then, of course, uh, we have to use the uh, heavy viscoelastics to deal with an empty uh, capsular bag or a lax posterior uh, capsule, which keeps on uh, uh, flapping and, of course, you know, reduce the parameters at the end stage of uh, uh, when the uh, nucleus has been uh, Taken care. I mean, the, at the end of uh, towards the end of the fake analysis. These are a few things which help us do our job well. And we've been doing intuition cataracts. I mean, everybody has to do, and it keeps on coming our way. But Gaurav's presentation was excellent. So was Dr. Titian's uh, remarks. Uh, hope we uh, learned quite a lot. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you sir. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, Dr. Tatyal. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Devasi, for getting these points. We did a small survey, and uh, you would all agree for the last three months, everybody is facing with these white intermission cataracts. So, the basic point was to get uh, these response from all practitioners so that they would be uh, giving their results to the best of their abilities. Thank you so much. Now, we have uh, Dr. Shreyas uh, Ramamurthy.
uh, who would be uh, presenting this case on his black and brown cataracts. And uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Amit Porwal to introduce Dr. Shias. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sonu, for the, uh, for the invitation. So, Dr. Shreya Samurthy is a consultant in cornea, cataract, and refractive services at the Eye Foundation in Coimbatore. He's got special interest in laminal corneal surgeries, including dark DSEC and DMEC, mucous membrane crafts, stem cell transplantation, and keratoprosthesis surgeries. So, for guided instrument uh, treatments, contour elastic, smile, fake IOLs, and he's got 28 peer reviewed publications. He's a gold medal awardist for IRS 2017 and at an IO meet in Pune, conducted in 2018. He's completed his FICU. So over to you, Shreyans. So we invite Dr. Gravewal. Uh, welcome, sir. And Dr. J.K. Reddy as the panel uh, for uh, this wonderful video that Shreyas has joined us. All to you, Shreyas. Yes. Thank you, Amit, sir, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Sonu, sir, and uh, Partha, sir, for having me here. Uh, so today I have been asked to talk on uh, cracking the brown and black cataracts. I don't have a formal presentation, but just a couple of videos which I'll keep under four minutes. So I'll start off with the case uh, directly. So this is a, a grade uh, four to five uh, nucleus. And uh, this was a patient who was also wanting a toric multifocal lens. So you can see the toric markings in place. Uh, Tripan blue is something definitely which we use in these cases uh, as you don't necessarily have a good wet glow and using a good viscoelastic is always helpful. With regards to the capsule or excess size, I like to make it slightly larger than what I would in my traditional cases uh, because it helps in uh, even if you're not able to chop it wonderfully and if you have to uh, extract larger pieces, but at the same time not too large that you don't have an overlap over the lens. Doing a gentle but multi-quadrant hydro is extremely important as any aggressive movement of this nucleus can cause a zonular dialysis in these cases. I do a, a central trench. Now, the length of the trench is not necessarily very important. It's the depth which is more important. But a, a central debulking always helps as it provides more space. And it also helps you to occlude deeper so that your first chop can go right up to the crater itself. Now, this chop in these hard cataracts, because you don't want too much lateral extension, may not go right or across to the entire extent to the, uh, to the other end. So rotate the nucleus by 180 degrees and then go on to chop at a deeper level till the central spine is broken down. Again, you can do the same things, occlude and again, keep chopping. As you can see, I keep going deeper and deeper till it is uh, chopped right up to the center. Uh, traditionally, what is being referred to as a multi-level chopping you, are, you start a little more superficial, but keep going deeper till you're right up to the base. I'll talk a little bit more about the emulsification in my second video, which I'll be showing. But suffice to say, uh, uh, it is important that you have chopped it down into multiple pieces before you go ahead with the emulsification process itself. Subsequently, there is usually very little cortex left in these cases. Uh, I go ahead with the IOL implantation here. Like I mentioned earlier, having a large capsular excess is helpful, but again, it should not be too large, especially when you're doing these uh, toric or multifocal lenses, as you need a, a uniform overlap, as you can see in this case. And um, subsequently, once the lens is placed, it's uh, important that you do a complete viscoelastic removal from behind the lens. And before I uh, remove the uh, irrigation cannula, I position the lens, hydrate the opposite port so that there is no sudden shallowing of the chamber hydrate both ports so that the lens is perfectly in position. Moving on to this next decidedly darker and blacker uh, nucleus, uh, it's, uh, the pupil is also slightly smaller in this case. I do a gentle multi-quadrant hydro, just summarizing the points which I mentioned in the earlier case and ensure that I have a good rotation. Now here, as you can see here, I'm making a really deep central uh, crater so that I can uh, embed as deep as possible so that I can crack the spine of this uh, hard nucleus. Now, as you can see, I go ahead with a horizontal chop. And as I do it, it's only the half nucleus right up to the center, which is cracked. I rotate it by another 180 degrees, go ahead, and then complete the chop right up, uh, up to the center. Now, even when you lose a hold, it's important that you let go, go ahead and grasp it again, and then continue your chopping. You will not be able to chop right up to the very depth, probably in your primary chop in these hard cataracts, 
So it's important that you keep separating, going deeper at a multi-level and ensuring that those the last bit of fibers are also separated. It's important that you have a complete separation before you start emulsifying the pieces. Because any premature emulsification or any premature attempt to remove the piece into the anterior chamber can cause excess stress on the zonules. And it's important when you start removing the first piece that you ensure that your, uh, that your uh, capsular excess margin, you have a look at it and ensure it's not tilting in one direction because any excess maneuvers during your chopping procedures can cause a little bit of zonular dialysis and you have to be exceedingly careful that it does not extend during the res uh, residual part of your FACO emulsification. Towards the last pieces, one important thing to keep in mind is that the FACO emulsification needle can actually bore uh, through the uh, density of the nucleus and you have to make sure that your uh, nuclear piece is not above the tip of your FACO needle. You have to ensure your FACO needle is always above the uh, nuclear piece and there is a sufficient nuclear piece below your FACO needle so that the FACO needle is not directly exposed to the posterior capsule. These are just some of the simple tips that I follow for dealing with these uh, dense nuclear cataracts. I hope you have found it useful. Fantastic presentation, Shreyas. Uh, I think you have showed most of the difficult case. I think as uh, Sonu was mentioning his previous presentation, now all of a sudden after this COVID era, I think we started getting grade 4 cataracts, mature cataracts, I think uh, uh, very nice presentation. I think uh, Dr. Greval sir is here. I think uh, he's been uh, oh, always promoting for like uh, premium lenses even in case of a harder cataract. I want his opinion regarding this. You will have to unmute sir. Sir, unmute Greval sir. Is it okay? So thank you so much, uh, KP, and thank you, Shreyas, for uh, great surgery and uh, good tips that you have given in the in the surgery. It's important, the capsulotomy, if I, I would prefer that to make an oval capsulotomy in these cases with a long axis along the main incision that gives you a greater space to work with your FECO tip. Uh, you were right that hydrodelineation, hydrodissection should be minimum because it's a big hard nucleus. You don't have much space to work for it. Uh, the first chop is very, very important and I would prefer to make a wider trough, a deeper trough and going just up to the center. It should be short, not too long so that you have enough of the bulk of the nucleus left to hold and chop. And I'll prefer to have the first fragment very small and then have a little bigger fragment because if you make your first fragment a little bigger, it becomes difficult to pull it out. And uh, I would like to proceed to the first only after I have been able to have the nucleus divided into two complete halves, as you said, to break the backbone. Uh, again, I'll say good presentation, excellent presentation, and good point. Thank you. JK, any time, the innovator, my friend JK Reddy is here. I think I want his few comments on this. JK? Thank you, uh, Dr. Prasad. And uh, uh, Shreyas has done a wonderful video. It's a superb surgery. And he's demonstrated very well how to uh, handle a very hard cataract, which we are seeing post-COVID, as mentioned by many speakers. We are seeing most of this type of cataract, mature cataracts and brown cataracts nowadays. A uh, little bit, it looks like he's more favorite of gentle uh, FICO, and he's using classical Nagahara chopper in his videos. But uh, most of us try to, to like our vertical chop in hard cataracts. I like to know the panelist's opinion. Uh, Dr. Ritial, sir, do you like vertical or horizontal in a hard cataract? Uh, I do a almost similar technique was uh, Shreyas has shown in a very, very hard cataract. I do a, a, not only trench, I do a crater and leave the peripheral part of a nucleus. So making a hard central core nucleus into a grade three or four subsequently. Then do a vertical chop. I don't do a horizontal. I do a vertical chop and uh, then separation and try to reach right up to the posterior plate. And he demonstrated uh, beautifully in uh, the first video was very, very nice teaching tips in that. And I uh, know normally would say like uh, in these cases, sometimes the energy goes too much. So you need to have a, a repeated, you know, arsenal of technique in these cases. I start begin with uh, soft shell technique then subsequently titrate if my you know uh, the energy goes uh, uh, 
uh, CD goes beyond uh, 20 or 30, then I do another uh, sorcery technique, especially when I have done a multiple uh, division of the nucleus and then take out one by one. And that is the time it requires a sorcery technique. Some cases you lose the epicortical uh, cushion in these cases and you hardly have sometimes. They're also uh, giving a viscoelastic tamponade to a posterior capsule also important in these days because by the end of a surgery, because a big nucleus, your posterior capsule becomes very floppy. And you have a machine, you have a little bit of surge, you, you try, you know, you cast the posterior capsule to a end. So that precaution we need to take. So I think the separation right up to the posterior plate is the key for a success in these uh, super hard cataracts. I just want to make a comment, uh, Kudlu, I think excellent videos. I just want to highlight uh, one of the facts and that is when you do these hard cataracts, then there are little small, small fragments as you finish the case, sometimes you don't see. And those fragments, they tend to be there, you know, near the side port or just behind your main wound or at the iris. Port. So when you take out your instruments, it is important to, uh, you know, address those fragments. And later on, you know, you find out that they are stuck there and then you have to address them with the help of viscoelastic to push them sir, the Just the one, uh, sorry, madam. Uh, yes, I'm done. Uh, no, just you. one uh, question or rather a question and a comment. Uh, I myself have, uh, uh, keep switching between these two. That is, uh, traditionally, a lot of people say uh, to remove uh, the pieces in these hard cataracts so that you get more space to work with uh, while evacuating them. But I actually find it more difficult uh, to chop once there is a lot of space in the bag and the uh, nucleus becomes more mobile and uh, it actually becomes even uh, it keeps twisting around in your phaco needle while you're trying to chop so i actually like to complete all my chops in these cases i just do that central uh, crater to give a give me enough space to have that separation but subsequently i like to complete my chops just wanted your views on it Yes, Reyes, you are absolutely correct that is what i told also because these nucleus are very very uh, large and the amount of uh, force required for uh, separating pieces can be, you know, uh, significantly much more. So if you have one area which you have eaten out, uh, that area is free, then tilt of a nucleus happens when you are trying to chop in these cases. Absolutely. The best is when the bag is completely filled, whatever pressure you're going to make, going to distribute in the entire bag. So that is the time you separate all the pieces, make a multi-chop technique which is nicely demonstrated, then eat one by one. Or even you have a small attachment in the center, doesn't matter because you can take all the pieces and at the end it becomes very easy. It's like a you know, mature cartridge where you don't have epicortical support. Uh, you have to have a division first, multiple divisions. Otherwise, you're going to have a difficulty and more chances of bag dialysis happening in such cases. Devashi, sir. Yeah, just wanted to make a quick point. Uh, I, um, uh, to preserve the uh, dispersive viscoelastic in place throughout the procedure, I go uh, on a continuous irrigation. And uh, here, you know, there are uh, uh, steps where you use a lot of en energy and that, and uh, there are process, uh, there are steps when we, you are not doing anything, you are trying to relocate and align the probe with the uh, fragments. So during that, I go to foot position zero. And uh, I mean, uh, so there is no aspiration. So in that way, you actually uh, keep the viscoelastic, which is and the corneal protection on. So I just wanted to make this. One last comment, comment from Dr. Ramamurthy, sir. Yeah, uh, I think all of them have been talking about direct chop, and that's what Shreesh also showed. So the cost of sounding a little old-fashioned, I'd also like to submit that you know, stop and chop is also a great technique in these cases. The sense that you know, especially some of these leathery cataracts, it's a little dif uh, difficult to chop. And in these cases, the down slope sculpting, where the most of the phaco power is deep in the uh, lens and well away from the cornea, though significant amount of energy is, there, you can literally make out that uh, you can uh, uh, create a trench deep enough so that you can introduce two instruments and completely divide the cataract into two hemi halves and under direct visualization. And once you have broken the spine, the rest of it becomes a little easy. So really hard mahogany cataracts. And where I feel there's a significant leathery element, I feel that uh, doing even a stop and chop would make a good idea, a good alternative. I cannot agree more to Ram. Cannot agree more. Yeah, Hambi, we can. <laughs> All old-fashioned guys. Uh, Hambi, we can. Ram, we do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs>
ಪ್ರೊಫೆ <laughs> Yeah, so with reference to the use um, of Femto using the Catalyst platform, you know, sometimes they would ask you to have like a repetition of the passes uh, for your segmentation. And if you did that, that would increase the amount of energy and the time. And that would create a lot of uh, gas production within this very hard and thick nucleus. And it may not be so safe when you have a very, very thick cataract. So actually, uh, I found that with 100% of the energy the maximum energy that uh the catalyst can provide you for fragmentation you just do a single pass and you just do eight segments and that is able to very quickly segment your nucleus with very little gas production so quick comment if i can make uh, uh oh, so uh, excellent uh, video shares and uh, um, very nice chopping techniques that you have demonstrated i also do the direct chop the only small uh, tip that uh, i would like to uh, give uh, for this is most of the time the plate does not get severed and that is the time where you need to use a little more energy and uh, it doesn't come tumbling up and uh, the, the little pies are all stuck together one uh, technique that i had already demonstrated uh, chop and harvest harvesting means to hold it with high vacuum lift up that small fragment and go manually with the sharp chopper and just sever the uh, fragment so that it just gets severed and then you just eat up that piece with very little of energy so a very small technique but uh, it really works very well even today you mean in the later part of the phaco emulsification uh, when you are left with that uh, plate you said yeah when it's left with it the up plate. and slice it yes yes thank you shreyas i think uh, you, wonderful sir. presentation and a wonderful learning pearl from all the masters so now we have the much awaited keynote address and uh, professor chi soon fake Uh, Dr. K P, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am there. Uh, so no, sorry for the uh, interruption. Uh, I think uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Chin Su Fai. Actually, she is the head of uh, UVA Ocular Inflammation, head of Cataract Research Group, and also I think uh, mentor for advanced training in ophthalmology, and also professor in the Duke National University of Singapore. graduate medical school also fellowship director singapore national eye institute probably she got the, uh, most of the awards i think i don't want to tell the every point of her biodate i think we have been keep meeting her in every conference the best part of her i think as uh, uh, our president maipal sir and even ptl sir said that we keep learning from her every time whenever she come to the conference she got the best uh, teacher award in snec and she has got the presentation almost every conference and she has got the award from i think starting from asia pacific uh, uh, i think studying from apao or apcrsc got the best paper award and she has got a 27 publications i think studying from asia pacific journal of ophthalmology till the journal of cataract and refractive surgery till 2012 word to professor chin su fai to hear from you she'll be talking about mastering uh, zonula mastering the zonular plasty sorry that i was just uh, out of uh, uh, the internet connection in between and our uh, moderator for this uh, particular keynote address none other than professor jeevan tithial sir also and namrata madam over to chinsu madam thank you very much let me share my slide now i hope you can see the screen yeah perfect okay so first of all i like to thank uh, the aios for kindly inviting me and uh, so new kindly helped me to choose the topic to speak on because he said you know you all like to hear about zonules and the absence of zonules 
And in particular, he told me not to talk about Femto because many of you may not have access to that. So let me just start. Uh, I have no financial disclosures of relevance to my talk today. And clinically, when you see a patient with a weak zonules, phacodonesis, it's important to determine at the slit lamp the site and extent of the zonular weakness. Right, so it's important to lie the patient down, especially if you do not have a UBM excess. Right, so if you see a patient uh, upright, you may think that this patient's got good vision. Why is he complaining? But when you lie him down, you realize that lens is no longer in the same anatomical position because it's actually got no zonular support. And usually when a lens does something like this, more than 180 degrees of zonular adhesions is present. Now, if you do have a UBM, you don't really need to lie the patient down to examine him because this test is done with the patient lying supine, right? So it's very, very useful. It can tell you the extent and whether the zonules are completely gone or partially gone. So you can actually tell also the location and the number of clock hours. So you have a patient here with intact zonules and we know the anterior, uh, equatorial, as well as posterior uh, zonules and you can examine for its presence. So if some of these are missing, you know it's partial zonular adhesions. You can also detect the presence of vitreous if you're not examining the patient carefully at the slit lamp, right? And in a case like this, there are really uh, no zonules here. What are the capsular support devices that we have available to us? We have a plain tension ring or you have the Bonnie Henderson uh, uh, modification where uh, you don't get trapping of the cortex after its insertion. You have modified tension rings for suturing. You have a one-point fixation or you have two-point fixation. And then you have these add-ons that are very, very useful that I use all the time, especially the capsule, uh, capsule tension segment. You can add one or you can add two. And recently, to add to our armamentarium, we have got the uh, Susan Jacob paperclip capsule stabilizer for a glued capsular uh, hook. And then we have the ASI anchor. So how do you decide what devices you need? Really depends on the extent of zonalysis, the strength of the remaining zonules, whether this is a static or a progressive disease. And generally you go by four clock hours, all right? So if you have uh, four clock hours uh, uh, missing, then you can just insert a CTR. If you're between four to eight uh, clock hours of loss, then you basically need one point of fixation and you have more than eight clock hours, definitely you need two points of fixation. And what devices you choose really depends on what's available to you and what you're comfortable with. And sometimes it also depends on the particular case, what is convenient to use. So uh, what is important is knowing what's the difference between iris hooks and capsular hooks because uh, we use them for different purposes. So in the case of uh, iris hook, uh, or a capsule hook, both do provide sen uh, suspension of the capsule in the anatomical position. They center the back, but iris hooks, unlike capsular hooks, they do not support the equator of the capsular bag, but they do provide capsular traction when you're doing a capsule rexus like this. So this is definitely better to use a hook than a, a capsular hook, an iris hook than a capsular hook. And you can also use this to invert your uh, hook and support a capsular tension segment eyelet. So for example, if you have no access to a capsular bag hook, you can actually use a capsular tension segment, uh, which you use suture in later, but you can use it in the time of FACO to just support the equator at this area. Suture material, generally we pro uh, propose the use of stronger material than 10O proline, so we use 9O. Or what I use routinely today is actually 7-O uh, Gore-Tex, it's CB8, although it's 7-O uh, Gore-Tex. It's off-label use for scleral fixation, and it's got excellent longevity. So I, I know I've presented many times the use of my suture snare technique, and I know many of you are very confused uh, because you see so many sutures running around. So I thought, well, if I just showed you this bare capsule tension uh, ring, this modified with a one-point fixation, this Yoni ring, and you have a cortex or a proline suture uh, already preloaded onto this. Now, if you think of how you're going to get it to your scleral fixation point, what would you do, right? So this is just to introduce to you the concept of a lasso. So I thought, well, if I had a suture here that could I could thread through the end, I could just lasso it 
and I could pull it back out at the scleral fixation point. So if you put the eye in place there, right, this comes into the scleral fixation point, and if I were to pull it, basically, I will be able to retrieve the suture here. So it's really a very, very simple concept, and you can look up this paper. So this is a case, a dense cataract, pseudo-exfoliation syndrome, and I'm just looking around. It said actually zonules were intact, although weak. You know, these, these uh, are the most difficult cases. They're small pupil, and you can see, well, the zonules may look like they're there. You can see the pseudo-exfoliation material. But really, you know, they give way during your surgery, especially when you have a dense cataract like this. So the shallow, I had a very shallow interior chamber. I decided to just put a hook to provide the counterforce. And I'm using an iris hook here. Right? It's a very black cataract. I did not want to use vision blue. It won't help me that much in providing contrast. But in addition, I didn't want the, the, the dye to stain the vitreous. All right, so I'm providing the counterforce as I go along. So now I've completed the rexis. So now I've completed the rexis. And a very important step putting viscoelastic just under the capsule to create space for the insertion of a capsule tension ring, the plain ring, right, just under the capsule, clean the section of the capsule away from the cortex. And now I know my equator is expanded. In addition, I'm providing more support by these hooks that support the equator and very short vertical trench. I impale, I like to do horizontal chop. Right? It can be a bit tricky if you don't know where the equator was. And that was the reason why at the start of this case, I used the Copeland hook to look at the equator. And at the end of that, before you come out, important to maintain the interior chamber and then insert the OL. And you will see that I had no cortex that was trapped. Now, if you have very weak zonules, it doesn't matter, you just mark anywhere 180 degrees apart. And then a Hoffman pocket. And now I insert a preloaded capsule tension segment. This is a cortex suture segment. And I'm just positioning it there in place. Now, very important, I've already pre threaded this needle which is a 27 gauge I use today, All right? I'm pulling out this lasso that we showed, putting the end of the suture through and pulling it out, like what I showed you with the lasso, All right? Create the space when your needle comes through. You don't want to puncture that bag uh, that you had been so careful in preserving, All right? So this is the lasso. I'm going to repeat it exactly the same on the other side. I find the use of the MSC faucets very, very useful to help me in position rather than Sinsky hooks where the segment can spin around, All right? So make sure that when you come through, you don't puncture anything. And that is done by putting viscoelastic so that you create the space between the iris and the back. So this is the lasso coming out through the main incision here and pulling my suture out now from the Hoffman pocket. It's important that the pockets be sected deeply enough because you do not want uh, exposure, erosion and exposure of this cortex suture, it will cause a granuloma that you have to go back and patch or change for a different material or suture. All right, so the tension is also important to ensure your RL is well centered. Okay, so let me show you the next case now. I have three cases, so this is my second case. So now we have another complex case. You can see everything is shaking and it's white and intermissive. So it's very nice that we had all these talks that went before. Right. Fortunately, it's important, uh, perhaps a pearl for you, when you don't have a zonular uh, attachment, actually the, there is very little tension on the anterior capsule. So there's less risk of this running out. But I'm now providing the counter force, which if I didn't, because there are no zonules here, it would run out. All right. So I then complete the rexis of the appropriate size. So you can see the shape is a little collapsed. I again inject the viscoelastic. In fact, every case, whether it's white or black, it's the same technique. Right? Inject the viscoelastic, creating the clean plane. Don't be happy until you have the clean plane. And then inject the CTR. Okay, now I know my equator is kept expanded. I put in the capsule hooks that provide further support. And then you can crack right through. All right, it's a little leathery, although this is white on the surface. 
and uh, you can try to minimize your rotation. And this is how I like to take it out. And you see that in all the surgeries that I do with this, I, I do it in a very similar manner. Chopping, sometimes you can't rotate. You impale to rotate the nucleus, all right? You swivel the nucleus around. And uh, you can see, actually, I don't have a red reflex. And that's because I had stained uh, the capsule. And now I notice that this has slipped off in my attempts to crack. Now this, I'm going to show you a little complication. Because I had done all my cracking movements, that hook had slipped off, a little vitreous strand came forward. And you can see I've got no good red reflex there. And I think I'm getting fluid misdirection because the hook had come out, I had not noticed. So I put the RL in first before completing my surgery. And I'm going to show you Sergio Canaravas technique of using proline. And this is 6-0. I've pre-threaded it. Nowadays, I, I don't thread it on the needle. I actually thread it um, through the needle as it comes in the eye. But this is just to show you with the capsule tension segment. Uh, the flange has been created. And I'm then positioning it. So this is 1.75 mm posteriorly. I pull out the 6O proline. I thread it through the capsule tension segment, make sure it's large enough so it doesn't slip through. And I'm not very happy here because I had some vitreous coming through just now. And so I'm then doing the vitrectomy here, right? Both behind as well as amputating one that come in front. And at this time, then I insert the capsule tension segment and apply the traction. And it's important that you apply the traction first before uh, you decide on what length, usually about 3 mm length for the diatomy. And then make sure that this is uh, really covered by conch nicely. And at the end, uh, you can insert some translone and then remove any residual vitreous. This is the final case I'm going to show you. It's a difficult case. You can see less than 180 degrees of zonulysis. We start with vitrectomy because there's vitreous line in front of this lens that is dipping posteriorly. Right? You want to remove adequate but not too much because it does support the lens. These vitreous uh, behind does support the lens. And with the 3 7 gauge needle bringing this lens forwards, I then catch it at where the uh, lens was, capsule was slit. And with a bimanual technique, right, you want to use forceps that are not sharp, okay? So I started with the capsule resistance forceps. I then continue with two MST micrograspers. And as you go along, you can start to support the capsule, the whole lens at the capsule resistance. And at this stage, it's okay to insert this uh, capsule back hooks. And I then switch everything to capsule back hooks so that the equator is now supported. We set that plane between the anterior capsule and the lens and then insert a plane CTR. Hydro dissection, this is much softer cataract. Okay, so we're doing a stop and chop here, cracking right to the base and then cross chopping. Okay, so that we don't really have to do any rotation. Tumbling out the first piece, the next piece, all right, you can just tumble all these pieces out. And because the dissection was adequate with the viscoelastic, the CTR does not trap the cortex. Insert the RL into the capsular bag, showing you again the suture snare. You can use a 26 or a 27 gauge needle with a short segment of the cortex suture, creating Hoffman pocket. In this case, uh, I was actually going to put in a toric RL here, and uh, you can then introduce the suture snare, 1.7 mm posterior to the limbus, and then bring the end of the suture loaded on the capsule tension segment through to the spiral fixation point. We repeat this. So now both sutures are there, and we repeat it for the other uh, segment. So if you, if you watch these three, they're all very, very similar. Just that, you know, we had a different extents of zonular weakness, different densities of cataract, one white, one black, one dipping into the vitreous, but really they are all the same. Okay.
So you can see in this case, I just use tension set to tension segments and CTR. This really makes it easy because if you had a only one L, you would have to keep rotating the eyelet to the right place. Okay, here you can insert the capsule tension segments without rotation, no torque, no stress on the rectus even. And even if you had a slight tear, you can still use. Okay, so this is uh, just to show you the end of this. Uh, so these are my pearls I leave, leave with you. If your lens is anteriorly subluxated and the patient is presenting with high pressure, right? I always run IV mentor. For white cataracts, I always run pre-op IV mentor. This will shrink the vitreous as well as the lens, all right? And very often will save vitreous uh, presentation and deepen the anterior chamber for you, all right? Uh, you need to be very careful when you use trifan blue, as I showed you the second case with the white cataract. The vision blue actually went to the back and stained the vitreous and it makes you lose that good red reflex and helps you in the surgery. If you see vitreous in the anterior chamber, you must always deal with that first. By manual CCC, when there is actually weakness uh, that's very severe, like what I showed you in the third case, um, use capsule back hooks because they support the equator. All right, iris hooks, as I showed you, can actually help you in your capsule rexis, support a capsule tension segment when you don't have capsule back hooks. Uh, delay the phase one of a CTR in general, but in cases like what I showed you where the severe zonulitis, I like to face it first because it expands the equator. And when you hook the bag up, basically you close off the space between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So you don't get fluid misdirection and you don't get vitreous presentation. You inject the OVD just be be below the anterior capsule and there is CTR in the space. This is very important so that you don't trap cortex and in all three cases I showed you, no cortex was trapped, all right? This is the key, right? I was asked not to show you femtosecond laser, although I do this quite commonly in these cases where the pupil dilates well, and really with the lens fragmentation, you know, dense cataract, these really help to make the case so much easier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Chisu. Uh, and I think once again, one of the fantastic presentation. Can you hear? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, one of okay. your pearl, I, I, you are talking about the, dealing with the vitreous in the anterior chamber. Do you use triamcinone acetate whenever you do vitrectomy or just to keep do like that only? No, I always use diluted TA. Yeah. yeah. So it's important to use it. Thank you, Professor Chi, for taking our message because we just wanted at large to society to benefit because not everybody has an access to the femtocatract. And we know that both work very well, or I'll say manual works very well under your, you know, uh, the, the surgery, the kind of surgeon you are. Amazing presentation. So I would request uh, Professor uh, Dr. Tial and Dr. Namrata Sharma to please uh, have your comments on uh, the um, spellbound surgery that she has showed to us. I think there is uh, nothing uh, much we can add to what uh, you know, Professor Chi has you know, shown us. As he's been a wonderful surgeon and a good friend of ours. And the videos were classical, the teaching tips. But I have few uh, you know, points to make as far as general uh, surgeons are concerned. Uh, we have to really know what uh, is the basic pathology behind these uh, subluxated cataracts. I normally would not like to leave the bags in a disease which is progressive, like, you know, ectopia lentis cases. Or you have a hypermature cataract, like you sold one, pseudo exfoliation, or a chronic uh, you know, degenerative disorders, or vitrectomized eyes, where the bag may not remain stable for a very long time despite uh, fixation sometimes. So if you have a gross subluxation, like you so, so, sold us the third case, I might take the you know, bag out in such cases and do a you know, uh, transcranial haptic fixation of IVL, which may be more stable for long term. Otherwise, the surgical tips uh, you showed was uh, very nice. The suturing technique you made uh, look so simple. But uh, I, I'm normally, I don't uh, you know, get into those uh, difficult situations. I'm lucky I'm in an institution where I have friends who can take care of these cases. I have Rajesh Sena. My colleague would take care of all these cases where I don't have to do a fixation at all. So those are, I think, difficult cases, but very nicely managed. Thank you. Fantastic uh, presentation, I think. I just uh, wanted to ask you a couple of questions. One is you mentioned toric intraocular lens implantation in these subluxated bags. So 
do you routinely do and do you think your results in terms of misalignment are any different from are any different from cases where you know the bags are uh, uh, normal and they are not subluxated especially the uh, not really uh, you know some people believe that if you insert a capsule tension ring it would actually stabilize the toric ll to and reduce rotation rates so i have not actually seen these actually rotate in, in i i do that for marfan syndrome even where the bag may be even smaller and you know that lens is really uh, squashed and it does not move at all it doesn't go anywhere so actually i also put in um, i think uh, i was asked during the woc you know someone said i saw you put in a multifocal lens you know is it safe and you know are you sure of your calculation well i don't use a trifocal lens because we know that we need to be very precise with trifocals but i use a edop lens so that even if i'm not exactly you know in the plane that we predicted the elp to be because it's difficult to uh, predict the elp in some of these cases especially if they're anteriorly subluxated or posteriorly so um i rather use an edop lens if the patient is young and want some kind of press barber correcting our l yeah but i've had good results with this and how do you decide where you're going to be using gotex or where you're going to be fixating it you know uh, with the proline and not using gotex so it's just to do random okay so i used to use uh proline but once i started on gotex okay you know what you see is really done very quickly i thread my gotex suture through my needle and my colleague can attest to that it's like 5 to 10 seconds okay but there are some tips when you thread it so firstly uh, when you cut that gotex suture you need to cut it at an angle so that you have a sharp point and that threads through a 27 gauge needle very easily Secondly, your fingers must be dry whenever you handle the cortex. The moment it is wet, it becomes limp and you cannot thread it. So I always make sure my fingers are dry when I handle it and I stretch it when I cut it so that I get this sharp point and then it goes through in seconds. Okay? So actually I find that, you know, once you have the ability to match and mix whether it's a CTR or a CTS I, I prefer to use a CTR and then add a CTS anywhere I wish to, and I can add two instead of one. So I don't worry now whether I have six clock hours, eight clock hours, or how many clock hours. These are guides that you know people ask for, all right? But if you have available capsule tension segments, you just add a CTR and you think of it well. When I'm doing my surgery, I don't really want this island there. I just want to expand the equator. All right, so you just add in the CTR. And then when it comes to the time where you need to fixate, you say, well, where is the area of greatest zonular adhesives? Now, if you had a Sony 1L, you would say, okay, I need to put it there, but I have to rotate. And I don't have enough counter force when I'm trying to rotate something that is severely zonalized. So it makes it difficult to do. All right, so what I do is I just slip in the CTS and insert it exactly where I want it. And very often when I put in the capsule tension segment, I will test it, all right? Especially if I'm only having one point of fixation, I'll push it to the equator and see whether that centers my RL. And you will notice that I always put in the RL before I put in the capsule tension segment and fixate it. Because it's the RL that tells me exactly where the bag is because the RL will always center on the bag. Okay, I don't look at the rectus even if you scan the capsula uh, bag, you know, with the with the catalyst and all that. It's not hundred percent accurate. I can tell you that for sure. Okay, I've been played out by the catalyst, you know, when I've done the scan. So I actually test it out with the capsule tension segment. Is this the best place if I'm just going to put one capsule tension segment? So if you push it here and no, my RL is not centered. Let's say here, and you say, okay, this is perfect centration, and then I mark my spot for fixation, and that's where I create my half point. But if you have two points to fix, it really doesn't matter. Okay, I just put it diametrically opposite. It doesn't matter where you do it. Yeah. Excellent tips. I think uh, those were great tips in the whole uh, whole of your presentation as well as uh, the uh, discussion thereafter. Excellent. Okay.
Thank you. I think the one, you know, initial tip you gave, you know, examining the patient on a supine position is a very good tip. Sometimes we do uh, never see these patients in a supine position. That's only on a table. Then you realize you have, you know, uh, such a large subluxation. A pupil also do doesn't dilate most often that well. And as soon as you inject viscolacy, then you realize you have a larger subluxation. So that's a very nice tip to examine patient supine position and do a UVM. I think that should be a uh, one thing people should take home. Do a UVM and I'd see the you know status of entire general complex. Very good tip. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chi, for that wonderful presentation once again. And I think all members would benefit uh, from your wonderful pearls. So without taking much time, I would now like to request uh, Dr. Shell Vasavra and uh, to welcome him. We have Dr. Feroz. Dr. Feroz, are you there? Yes. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, loud and clear. Program so far. So I take this uh, uh, immense pleasure to introduce our rising star, Dr. Shell Vasavda, who is a cataract and refractive consultant at Raghudeep Eye Hospital, Ahmedabad. I have known Shell as a meritorious resident who made one of the excellent talks in you know, the Patodia of LV Prasad Eye Institute. And uh, he has, we have seen him grow as an excellent surgeon and academician, many feathers uh, to his cap. He went ahead uh, doing his uh, cataract and refractive surgery uh, fellowship at Moran Eye Center in United States of America. Further to that, uh, he has been bestowed with various awards and few of them uh, to stress upon, he has uh, won the best paper at ASCRS in 2015. Congratulations, Shell. And one of the recent one is the best video at ESCRS in 2019. So we are very proud of all your achievements and we are looking forward to your talk and your work. Thank you. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nasir Shroff and Dr. Ramamurthy, sir, for being the panel for this talk. All to you, Shem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fairus, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and I think the times that we shared at uh, LVP are the most memorable so uh, in my life so far. And uh, once, of all, uh, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Sonu, sir, uh, and the AIS Scientific Committee for this kind invitation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Samresh and uh, Dr. Vaishali, uh, in creating this presentation. Um, at the outset, we do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories, but has no relevance uh, to this presentation. So after all the brilliant surgeries uh, by uh, the previous speakers, I'm going to show not so much brilliant surgeries uh, uh, which end up in iatrogenic complications. So this was a case which apparently seemed to be going off quite well after chopping. Fragment removal was being attempted. The first fragment was being removed. And you can see not a very dense cataract, a grade two, grade three kind of a cataract. Uh, the eyeball, if you notice, uh, is just moving a little bit uh, up and down, uh, but the surgeon seems to be doing quite well. After having removed the first couple of fragments, this was noticed, which uh, uh, retrospectively in the video, with the surgeon uh, didn't notice and went ahead uh, uh, with the fragment uh, removal. The centration also not being great, uh, uh, so probably visualization or attention was not being paid uh, at that point of time. So you have this nice little iatrogenic uh, hole or in the capsule that has already been created with three-fourths of the nucleus still in place. And uh, uh, the first thing that we want to do in this situation is not to pull out the instruments. So keep noticing the foot pedal here. We go back to foot. Now you go back to foot pedal, foot pedal one. Uh, then make sure that you inject dispersive viscoelastic before you withdraw your phaco probe so that the chamber doesn't shallow. So we will all encounter this uh, uh, complication, if not in such a simple case, maybe in a more difficult case. And the most important thing is to keep calm and not to panic and not to withdraw the instruments. Once that is done, now we need to extend, we need to assess the extent of the posterior capsule rupture. 
identify whether vitreous is already present in the chamber or not and also start preparing keep telling your uh, ot assistants to start preparing keep looking for the three backup three piece iol which may or a scleral fixated iol which may be needed eventually in this case uh, like professor chi showed uh, triamcinolone is of extreme uh, importance in uh, uh, diagnosing the presence or looking for the presence of vitreous Uh, and uh, very often we feel when the vitreous, vitreous phase is, not is disrupted present, uh, in the uh, uh, chamber but when you actually stain uh, you do find uh, vitreous coming even as close to the main port or the side port the second question is when to do vitrectomy if do you do do you try and remove most of the nucleus do you try and uh, delay it up to the cortex removal do you are you fearful that if i do vitrectomy now the nucleus will drop the answer is we need to address the vitreous whenever you notice it so it could be in the beginning of the surgery before starting the case it could be in the middle of the case it could be at the end of nucleus removal so you have to address it as and when it is required and one thing that we always forget is that we always feel that this nucleus is just you know in the area of pcr there's only little bit of vitreous let me first go and remove that with the phaco probe otherwise it will drop but what we forget in that uh, while in uh, trying to attempt that is the tremendous amount of vitreo retinal traction that we are causing at the vitreous base so it may not appear to be causing too much of problem and you may feel that you have gotten away with that but what it what the consequences it leaves behind to the periphery of the retina is something only our retinal colleagues uh, uh, would be able to tell us so it's something that should never be attempted that if you find a fragment sitting on a pcr or sitting in uh, wrapped with vitreous don't go with the phaco probe to try and remove it uh, and this is an excellent video uh, shared by my vitreo retinal colleague to show why we should never do that this is a, a drop nucleus and notice how much it is entangled all around by the vitreous and think of it as if you would go and attack this with a phaco probe think of the amount of damage that we are going to cause to the peripheral vitreo retinal base so therefore it's very very important that we first address the vitreous before actually thinking about touching the nucleus now the second goal of now having decided to do vitrectomy the goal is to prevent acute intraoperative vitreo retinal traction and salvage the eye and not to try and salvage the sinking lens material anyhow so if it drops follow the bye bye technique let it go and let our colleagues take care of it they can do a much better job than what we can do uh, as an anterior segment surgeon our goal is to prevent further enlargement of the pcr and try and provide a symmetrical scaffold and we have two approaches to do that the limbal being the more familiar to us um, but uh, this beautiful animation experiment by my by my colleague dr samresh showed that when you actually do a vitrectomy from the limbal approach you tend to pull in more vitreous from below actually enlarging the tear versus when you drain the vitreous from the pars plana approach you are actually attacking it from where it's coming out so you are draining it from that hole so there are you're uh, you're not actually pulling up on more vitreous and lesser chances of the uh, posterior capsular enlargement and also it allows for more symmetrical vitreous removal with the limbal vitrectomy ergonomically it's almost impossible to remove symmetrical vitreous from around the posterior capsule tear and therefore you would have pockets of more vitreous on one side or less vitreous on the other side which can lead to tilting of the bag and eventually of the iol and compare that to the pars plana approach where you have great ergonomic access all around to remove vitreous symmetrically or all, all around the posterior capsule tear so coming back to our case the first thing that we want to do is to stain this uh, uh, area with uh, triamcinolone and sure enough there was plenty of vitreous which had already prolapsed into the anterior chamber uh, we prefer going through a trocar because that will allow ease of uh, you know uh, frequent removal and uh, insertion of the vitrector but you need not necessarily need a trocar and notice how this entire bulk of vitreous has drained beautifully so i'll just replay that notice this chunk of vitreous has drained down beautifully through that posterior capsule tear now the connection of this to the anterior segment has been severed and now you go ahead and do symmetrical uh, try and do some vitrec vitrectomy even around that posterior capsule tear for symmetrical removal once you have done that then we go ahead with phaco emulsification and believe me it is safer to do uh, phaco emulsification with the nucleus still remaining after a vitrectomy done 
rather than without a vitrectomy done and to do that i i think dr osher's video many years ago was one of the best videos to show why a nucleus drops and if it's wrapped with vitreous it's going to drop much the chances of it dropping are much faster compared to if it is clean and away from the vitreous cavity so maintain a very low flow rate we used a flow rate of about 12 cc per minute and we could manage to remove the uh, vitreous i mean the nucleus uh, without a drop in the uh, of the fragment cortical removal was done and now what we are doing is we are doing a, a trying to remove symmetrical vitreous from all around this large posterior capsular tear to try and make sure that there are no unequal pockets remaining on any other side so you can notice how easy it is to manipulate or maneuver this probe all around uh, these strands that you see are dispersive viscoelastic they usually don't go away as uh, easily and some will remain but that's that's fairly okay with such a large posterior capsule tear it's uh, there is no question of uh, an in the bag iol and the best way to go ahead to deal with this is to use a multi piece or a three piece iol uh, and if the anterior capsule rexis is intact the best way to stabilize this lens is to place the haptics in the sulcus uh, make sure that the leading hapt haptic goes in the sulcus and then once that is achieved you just button hole the optic through the anterior capsule rexis the uh, anterior optic capture this will do two things this will make sure that the bulk of the optic is away from the iris so less chances of uveal irritation pigment dispersion and macular edema and also will this this will lock the three piece iol in place therefore less chances of decentration and anything happening in the end of course uh, it's always a good idea to suture such wounds and always reconfirm in the end for presence of any vitreous uh, by injecting triamcinolone even at the last part or at the end of surgery uh, there was no further vitreous disturbance in this case and wound hydration goes uh, without saying uh, this is the patient about more than 6 months post op well centered three piece captured through the anterior capsular rexis it goes without saying a very detailed peripheral retinal evaluation from time to time is required by your vitreo retinal colleague and keep doing repeated octs these patients are at a higher chance of developing post operative cystoid macular edema uh, the the so the main hesitation that all of us have while dealing with the pcr and doing vitrectomy particularly with the pars plana approach is to how do i adapt it's a mental block that we have remember it's just about 2 3 mm away from where you are entering your probe even otherwise uh interact with your colleagues interact with your with your retinal colleagues see videos talk with them observe how they do uh, and i think once we get over that mental block uh, this approach surely helps to improve outcomes in uh, in in an unforeseen situation like this so with that i would like to end my presentation and um, thank you so much for the patient listening thank you shail for your wonderful presentation i think it was uh, you within 4 and 1/2 minutes you could able to cover most of the take home messages uh, i think we have two senior panelists especially for this particular talk one is dr nasi sharaf i think he has started from i think probably intracapsular cataract extraction till feco so i want nasi sir's few message of, uh, regarding this pars plana vitrectomy because initially we used to do the uh, posterior lip levitation to to get the nucleus into the ac some people used to do a feco so over to dr nasi sharaf sir kp i think uh, we can pass on to dr ramamurthy i think dr. ramamurthy not... sir is also here i think sir has been a tremendous surgeon i think he's been guiding us for all those years you know especially managing such cases sir your opinion i think uh, shail has covered almost everything and the best i can do is to just summarize some of the the points that he touched upon and basically the first important thing is to recognize that you are having a pcr and uh, two things that we uh, fundamentally look for is that when there is loss of followability suddenly you find that things are all going slow and there is a deepening of the anterior chamber and uh, that's when you start suspecting that uh, there is something wrong the most important point that uh, shall emphasized upon is that at that time you do not uh, uh, pull out your instrument feco probe suddenly but go ahead and uh, uh, um, inject some uh, uh, viscoelastic preferably um, uh, dispersive viscoelastic to tamponade that area and keep the anterior chamber well formed and uh, 
the tension well maintained so that there is no extension. And just in case, uh, again, he emphasized the importance of using uh, tram cellulone at any point of time. Whenever I have to deal with uh, um, with test trans, I think it's a good idea to use this always. And uh, another important aspect is if the nucleus is really sinking and going down, it's important that you don't uh, go running uh, after that, go chasing after it. But it's best to uh, close up and leave uh, leave it to your vitreoretinal colleague to deal with it. Of course, often the question comes up whether you can just do a good removal of all the nucleus material as well as the, do an adequate anti vitrectomy and whether you can place an intraocular lens or not. I think if there is enough excess support with the kind of fragmatomes and other uh, vitreoretinal equipment that's there, you can always place an intraocular lens, position it properly, and allow your vitreoretinal colleague to deal with it. Then coming to the very important question of whether you would do the vitrectomy through the anterior route or through the pasquina route, I think Shail and his uh, um, institute, both through their multiple presentations as well as the excellent uh, graphics, have often demonstrated that pasquina is the way to go. I tend to agree, and having uh, done a bit of vitreoretinal surgery, I do not think uh, making a, a incision with the trocar and introducing a uh, vitrectomy probe is very difficult. And especially in a situation like what uh, Shell showed, where there's a large rent, much of nucleus that's left over, maybe going through the posterior route is the right way to go. And there's adequate vitrectomy that you can achieve. But just in case it's right in the end of my surgery, like when I'm dealing with a posterior polar cataract, a little bit of polishing of the posterior capsule, then I have a small rent and a knuckle of it is coming out. Let me say that I still prefer the anterior route to do this. And of course, using Tramstone as a uh, state to uh, help me. And uh, uh, it's extremely important that you have three-piece lenses with you, always in, uh, uh, available to you. Because whenever you are in doubt, even though you might still feel there's adequate amount of posterior capsule, you might want to go ahead and uh, uh, implant the lens in the back. Still, I'll go ahead and use a three-piece lens. Uh, because just in case the lens doesn't appear to be stable, I can uh, bring it out into the sulcus, leave it there, create a good optic capture. If the entire bag is uh, unstable, the same lens can be used even for uh, doing um, a scleral fixation. So I think uh, unless, of course, it's a very small rent, localized rent, or you have made a posterior capsular excess, and you are, you are absolutely sure that you are, you are going to implant the lens in the bag. And as far as the the IOL power calculation in these cases is concerned. If you're going to create an optic capture, there's no need for uh, varying the power at all. But if you're going to leave it in the sulcus, maybe reduce it by about 0.5 optics. I think uh, excellent presentation, Shail. I mean, I don't think I really added much to what you presented. I'd be the best I could do was to just summarize the points you made out so beautifully. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, I need uh, Dr. Suha Sandipurkar, one of the genius FACO surgeon, is also with us. Uh, we want his opinion regarding management of PCR because I have seen him who, doing live surgery where he even had a PCR and he showed the whole crowd how to manage PCR in, in his own technique. Over to Dr. Suha Saldipurkar, sir. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Krishna Prasad. Uh, what Shail has shown is something uh, uh, that one has to adopt today. Like gone are the days when we did, uh, you know, manage vitreous from anteriorly. Uh, past planar vitrectomy uh, to you know suck out the vitreous is probably the best way to go about. And I fully agree with uh, Ramu that you know it all depends on at what stage you are in your surgery. Uh, let's say if you have almost done with your nucleus, or maybe a single piece is left, and you have picked up your vitreous pretty early in the you know in the PCR, then I would you know probably probably go and manage it after putting triamcellulone. But if it's a larger part of the nucleus that is still in the AC, I think the best option would be to go past plana. But at the same time, what I would do is, if it's a significantly large quadrant, then I would, after completing my past plana vitrectomy, I would rather do a you know, scaffolding of a lens, which is kept and take that nuclear fragment in front of it and manage it. But it's always important that if you have a larger nuclear fragment and if you still have to do FACO uh, with an unstable posterior capsule, it's better that you have something to support and the scaffolding for lens 
comes very handy. Thank you, Suha, sir. So continuing the spectrum of subluxated lenses, posterior capsule ruptures, we now have tackling subluxation, mild to severe, and none other than the master himself, Dr. Ashwin Agarwal. So, Ashwin, all to you. And uh, I would request Dr. Parikshit Gokte to introduce uh, Ashwin. Uh, Dr. Ashwin Agrawal is a smart, dynamic cataract, cornea, and refractive surgeon, and an anterior segment reconstructive surgeon, as he calls it. Says. And he's the executive director and the chief of clinical services and chairman of the clinical board at Dr. Agrawal's group of eye hospitals. Coming from a illustrious family of ophthalmologists, Dr. Ashwin has still managed to hold on his own and I'm sure we'll be seeing him take ophthalmology to greater heights. Over to you, Dr. Ashwin. So I would invite uh, the panel for this video, Dr. Suhas Haldipurkar and Dr. Partha Biswas. All to you, Ashwin. Thank you, Dr. Sonu, and thank you, AIOS uh, Scientific Committee team. Uh, this, is, this webinar has been absolutely fabulous and stunning in its own regard. So let me uh, continue with my uh, talk today. My talk today talks about subluxations and I know uh, there are a hundred ways to skin a cat. Probably I'm just going to show you guys two favorite techniques of mine, which I think I've been using over the past uh, uh, more than probably three, four years now. And uh, I think they're very crucial in, in different elements. Uh, Dr. Chi and uh, what Shell just now showed is actually a preclude to whatever I am going to talk on. So thank you so much, Dr. Chi and Shell to uh, talk about or put the context in what I'm going to talk today. So I'm going to show you uh, two special techniques of mine. One in a milder case is what I do. Uh, if you have a look at this, this is a <clears throat> mild, when I say my case, the traumatic case, uh, in a traumatic case, more than 180 degrees of subluxation. Uh, I've started to move over to this paperclip uh, stabilizer, capsule stabilizer, where I'm making a scleral flap on one side. And I'll come to why I'm making that partial thickness scleral flap later. But the, uh, the purpose you're done is actually make a capsular excess. After you're done a CCC uh, and performed your hydro dissection, uh, you can see that this nucleus is rather soft in its own way, but there is some rigidity to it. And I'll tell you why well, that's important. After that, I've made a sclerotomy uh, approximately 1.25 millimeters behind the limbus there. And I'm placing this uh, PMMA uh, haptic based uh, paperclip capsule stabilizer inside the eye. Uh, after that, I'm placing now two capsule tension, uh, capsular hooks to hold that bag in place during my phaco emulsification. This paperclip capsule stabilizer goes under the anterior capsular rim at a two point fixation, if you see here. There are two points here, which is where it fixes, which is why it's also a little bit safer than uh, for a longer period of time, especially because we'll be leaving this and not touching this even post-operatively. Now I'm using a Gibor Shariat's tunnel at the base of the flap. And now completing my phaco emulsification, as I told you, this is a rather soft one, but nonetheless, soft or hard, no matter what well, nucleus it is, Anytime you remove a nucleus, you will have that bag equator crumpling on itself the minute you remove the nucleus. And that's the important aspect which I want everybody to grab here. So just the paperclip stabilizer is probably not going to be enough. And at this point, I urge everybody, uh, after they are done with their phaco emulsification, to place a capsule tension ring that holds that equator at bay, prevents any vitreous from coming forward, and also prevents any aqueous misdirection, which I think Dr. Chi showed very nicely can happen in these cases because the aqueous does go behind and hydrate that vitreous, pushing a positive thrust from behind, which is what you want to prevent. Now, after the phaco is done, you actually just remove the capsule uh, hooks and place the intraocular length in the bag as is. You don't change much. You can actually rotate pretty smoothly because you already have a capsule tension ring. You have your paper clip. Uh, capsule stabilizer, as you can see over here, it's holding that bag uh, in at bay. And the these are the post-operative images of immediate post-op, 
is right here. And I'll show you the first day post op of it with the 2020 vision, uh, the immediate next day, uh, which is why I, I'm kind of starting to love this because I don't have to use any sutures. There's no confusion and it's immediately over. I don't have to do anything post placing the lens. And this is the post operative uh, image of day one. Uh, this is one case that I wanted to show in a mild scenario what I do. Let's just see another case. And I think this goes on to what Dr. Suhas was talking about just now. Uh, if it's a very deeply uh, subluxated lens like, like this in a traumatic condition, first up, I'm always measuring which way I want to use the glue dial. I know I have to do a glued intraocular lens in this case because it's far too severe a subluxation. But having said that, I also have to remove the nucleus. So in order to remove that nucleus, I'm first making my ports. I've made it at six and nine o'clock. Now I'm using a modified PAL technique popularized by David Chang and making the, using the modified PAL technique, I'm bringing that nucleus into the anterior chamber using some pilocarpine and through the ports as well as limbal route, I'm using a anterior vitrectomy. Now after the anterior vitrectomy is done, because I'm using the nucleus, which is more transparent and I can tell you I've done even grade two, uh, almost reaching grade three with these in, this, in these scenarios. And I can tell you that you can easily see through these blue haptics under the nucleus. So you really have to ensure which nuclei you can see and can't see. Also, you have to see which grade you want to emulsify. I'll tell you why that is important. But the idea here is to basically do the glued intraocular length under the, uh, the nucleus. And once this handshake technique is done and you're able to externalize both the haptics outside, uh, and using the Gebaud Chariot's tunnel, stabilize this. Uh, uh, some cases, if it's a pediatric case, I even go and put a suture on that uh, to hold it. And just emulsify this. Why this helps is because, as I think Shell also showed, that you want to emul you want to do phaco emulsification. You want to have some protective mechanisms so that the pieces don't go flying inside the vitreous cavity. The IOL with the small pupil really help you prevent that from happening. Once you're done with this, you can actually also test uh, whether there's any vitreous in the anterior chamber. But fortunately for me, nothing had prolapsed into the anterior chamber here. And what I'm basically doing here is, as, as I told you, we're done post-operative day one. These are the two cases which I thought was very important. There are far more. There is one more, but I, I think in interest of time, I'm going to stop with the mild and severe uh, cases, which I thought was very interesting to show uh, in an audience like this. Thank you so much, Ashwin, for a wonderful presentation. As usual, you keep showing uh, some interesting devices to hook the capsule. I think uh, more comments from, I think, Dr. Partha is here. He's been sitting quietly and observing what uh, his committee members are doing. I need his uh, strong opinion regarding, uh, especially you, know, you did a FACO, I think, uh, sort of a, how Amarsar do that, uh, sort of a, you support with the lens, then you do the FACO. But my one question to you, especially in that case, what Shail showed that, do you have to do a pars planar vitrectomy? We don't know how much the vitreous is disturbed behind. You have put uh, triamcinone acetate in the anterior chamber, make sure that it is not disturbed. But do you have to really decompress the vitreous or just leave it like that? Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, KP, for asking a very, very uh, focused question. I think it's a very important question. And uh, today we really have had a, a wonderful array of videos shown by so many surgeons addressing similar problems. And now Ashwin has shown uh, excellent videos as well. So about the vitreous in the anterior chamber, and as Professor Chi showed very well, that whenever vitreous is in the anterior chamber, the first thing is to do a vitrectomy to take it out. So uh, with the subluxation and vitreous in the anterior chamber, if the vitreous is taken off the anterior chamber, the actual amount of subluxation becomes evident. So it might be actually a little less or a little more. So once that is done and uh, thereby the pass planar approach uh, shown by uh, Basroda sir and the group is the right approach to go ahead with. Because even in a case where a pass planar vitrectomy cannot be fully done, and if there is a drop of the nucleus, then the VR surgeon can take over and uh, the ports are ready uh, to be taken over. So these are um, a few things that uh, we definitely need to uh, do and uh, think of. The other thing that uh, 
uh, show, was shown in Ashwin's video, the paper clip, the, the Susan J. Jacob paper, paper, paper clip technique is also very, very uh, interesting and very innovative. And I think once that is popularized, uh, the paper clip uh, can become a very good tool for as an anchoring device. Suha, so, sir, your opinion regarding the these cases? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm happy uh, Ashwin is uh, walking in the footsteps of his, his father. Uh, you know, his, let's talk about his second case. Now, when, he, when Amar or he shows such cases, even a decent surgeon gets scared. I mean, these are something like from a fantasy land. So I'll safely go to the first case. Now, first case, he had his traumatic uh, subluxation. One advantage of a traumatic subluxation is that the remaining zonules are healthy ones. So that makes your, I mean, you have already won half a battle there. The yeah. only thing that needs to be checked is, like you rightly said, whether there's vitreous in the anterior chamber. And after that, he could uh, relatively get a good and easy rexis because his other healthy zonules were helping him. And then if you notice one thing, he managed to get that uh, clip, you know, uh, the other end taken out of the back and uh, taken out of the eye. And after that, he put his clips, uh, put his uh, hooks. Because once you put your hook, the gap between your iris and the uh, lens periphery is obliterated, then it is difficult to get the clip out. And because it's a clip, unless you have rexis which is firm, the clip cannot be hooked onto the rexis edge. And after that, I think uh, the case was as normal. And uh, Ashwin, I must compliment you. You have good surgical lens. You really showed both the cases well. And it's been very useful to all the viewers and us also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. I Mahi think uh, Dr. Mahipal, sir, uh, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Mute it, sir. Yeah, so, uh, so no, what I'll just wish to say that uh, two days ago we conducted a symposium in WOC, and uh, that was exactly on the similar topics uh, absence of capsular support, etc. And I was also surprised myself. So actually we did an audience poll and uh, the, I just taking it out. Uh, the four questions were, what is your, pre uh, four choices were, what is your preferred technique for IOL fixation in the absence of capsular support in a fakia? Uh, Professor Chi was also part of that. David Chang was there, Thomas was there, uh, Richard Packard and all. Uh, so uh, the voting actually surprised me was that 20% of the respondents said that ACIOL is their first choice. 46% of the respondents said iris claw lens was their first choice. 26% said scleral suture fixation was their choice. And only 6%, only 6% said any form of intrascleral haptic fixation, whether it be the Yamanese technique or whether it be the glued IOL. And uh, that was after two talks, one on Yamane and one on uh, the uh, glued IOL. So I'm uh, uh, surprised uh, I was because normally when we are working in tertiary centers, uh, we do have support of vitro retina people and we go in for intrascleral fixation. But unfortunately, uh, the people who are uh, so, uh, so uh, they uh, stay uh, prefer uh, an anterior chamber Kelman multiplex or an iris claw that consists of two thirds of the respondents. That is something uh, that came out uh, and uh, when we had the first one, but, uh, that was that if you have a complicated cataract surgery and PCR during that time, uh, at that particular time, intrascleral fixation of the haptics, it was 0%. Not even 1% said that that was, their, uh, that was their preferred thing. So maybe, I don't know uh, globally whether it is uh, something which is preferred or not, but uh, this is the response in the session of uh, WOC held two days ago. I think uh, it is primarily because of the ease of uh, the way you can do the lenses and I think ACI will and, and, and the iris claw are the easiest to do. That is why, you know, they are primarily the first choices. And of course, once if you have intraoperatively, then glued eye oil becomes difficult to make the sterile incisions and people have to still learn it. But I think in India, it is a little different because... Uh, we are, I think, more dexterous as compared to... Also, also I think that the audience uh, probably were from the African region. So 
probably that's also another cause for that because they don't have the uh, probably know how of the glue dial i'm not sure but that could be an answer for that so the that audience is i think from all over all over panel or the people here as to what exactly would their first choice be is it that uh, we have uh, 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 because it came out of india so we have lots and lots of talks in these sessions and has it actually made a difference in the uh, practice patterns of the ophthalmologist would they still uh, are people still not have they totally left uh, kelman multiplex or have they totally left uh, the iris clip etc because dr ramamurthy is here i think he uh, gives excellent talks about retrofixation of iris clip etc so i think maybe if we actually do a poll within india also uh, whether yeah. we are extras or not is not the issue namrata the question is what is the preferred practice in single practitioners and the number of practitioners who are there in india are they still on uh, kelman and uh, iris clip uh, or uh, some form of we can comment uh... we have used uh, multiplex kelman for you know so many years and as such if you see the kelman uh, lens there have not been too many problems with that yeah there have really not too many any problems except for the iris claw which was fixated anteriorly again with the one which is done posteriorly i don't think there are again too many problems i think dr ramamurthy has more yeah, experience in that i think uh, yeah i mean we have been regularly whenever we are faced with a problem and the capsular support is completely lost and we are able to do a good and adequate anterior vitrectomy then we go ahead and if the anterior segment surgeon is performing the cataracts when I mean, obviously it's anterior segment surgeon performing and most often it's under topical anesthesia then uh, slipping an iris clip lens and just creating a adequate uh, uh, enclavation is extremely easy and it just takes about a few minutes and uh, at the same time if you have had a nucleus drop and if you had a or a intraocular lens which has got subluxated and our one of our vitreoretinal colleagues is doing, helping us out and he or she takes over then what they do is to, if there's already a three piece lens or even if they have to replace they are more comfortable doing the screenal fixation of the lens so i believe that uh, when it comes to anterior segment surgeon performing a screenal fixation quite a few aspects that we are doing there in spite of so many wonderful videos that are shown by all of you there are certain things which are not visible which are not you know we are not comfortable operating in an area where which i'm not seeing and i believe there have been talks about uh, pseudo phacodonesis with the uh, iris uh, clip lens being, uh, being but I, i have not seen a single patient of mine being bothered by it of course as far as uh, placement of lenses in the anterior chamber is concerned there is enough literature to show that uh, these lenses also do well but you are always scared of leaving something behind in the anterior chamber because of its proximity to the corneal endothelium but i think a well performed iris clip lens where there's enough amount of iris tissue available uh, is an excellent alter alternative uh, in the right hands maybe dr haripriya and dr jk reddy what happens in your institutions uh, uh, what is the preferred uh, modality for if you have a pcr uh, large enough to not support a sulcus uh, lens uh, or there is a dialysis or whatever is uh, intrascleral fixation the preferred choice or uh, people uh, you uh, uh, people going for Kelman multiplex or iris clip retrofixation. Well, in our uh, in our institution, we do iris clip lens for a long time. Uh, in fact, when we had first the problem of uh, uh, the lenses available, because only that Daljit, as you know, that Professor Daljit Singh uh, has developed that, and there's very small lenses. Then we collaborated with the Excel Optics in Chennai and made a quite uh, sizable lens, a big size lens with a plano side on both sides. In fact, we developed that lens in our institute, and we are exclusively using it for the past 15 years. Uh, that is our first uh, choice, as Dr. Dr. has explained rightly. When you are doing in topical anesthesia, it's a quite a, a simple to just clip the lens, uh, extend the incision to 5.5, and clip the lens and put one suture and send the patient. And even in our uh, charity side also, that is our preferred technique. We use an average around for, for a for in a year. Uh, somewhere around 40,000 cases we do on charity side. We use around uh, um, almost around 600 to 700 lenses per year. The complication is quite very low when compared with anti-chamber lenses, or the time required for uh, scleral fixation. Dr. Haripriya. Yeah. So uh, we are not doing many anti-chamber lenses. The reason being, I think, an anti-chamber lens is very uh, easy to place, and a well-placed lens does very well. 
But considering the spectrum of surgeons we have, we found that when we have that option to the surgeon, some surgeons in training tend to uh, use them without the right sizing, not, not taking care of the vitreous properly, et cetera. So we had issues uh, post-operatively with the glaucoma and the damage, et cetera. So we've decided to stay away from anterior chamber lens for this reason. But someone who's really senior, of course, they would probably still choose an anterior chamber lens if they want to. The, in terms of the other options, we would the different surgeons choose different things. Most of the VR surgeons, if they would like mention, if they, if they had to do a combined surgery of a vitrectomy and IO replacement, they would do a stadial fixation, uh, Gebaud uh, Chariot's technique. The anterior segment surgeons, many of them do either the iris sutured or the iris claw lens. So this is what they would do. Few of them still do the sleral tuck uh, technique, even the anterior segment, then, but very few of them. And some would still do the sleral suture. So it's a kind of a wide range of techniques, considering we have different uh, centers and different uh, surgeons based on how they are trained, they would choose them. So there's no one specific technique. But I think the training also matters. The VR surgeon is, most of them would do this, while the rest would probably do do a more uh, limbal approach. So, but you guys are pretty good at demographics. So, supposing you were to do a poll or you were to look at your percentage of cases which have had uh, 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 Kelman multiplex slash an iris clip slash uh, 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 scleral fixation slash an intrascleral, uh, maybe you could go back and check and uh, it will be a good learning for us also as to what is the preferred practice because you have big numbers and uh, what are the outcomes. I think the only difficulty in that is that the cases are so varied, whether it's a primary surgery, secondary, is it you know, traumatic or is it a complication, yeah, is it yeah. combined? So the other variations, variables as well, which could affect the outcome. So that's I think, uh, As far as the Kelman, Kelman multiflex is concerned, one major consideration is the sizing of the lens. You get uh, good results if the sizing of the lens is appropriate. And the difficulty is when you have a complication on the table, measuring the white to white and having the right size lens available is an often a challenge. So whatever published literature is available, it's more based upon extremely well-sized lenses placed by very good experienced surgeons. But as was mentioned, when uh, complications happen more often in inexperienced hands and when you allow this to be uh, these lenses to be placed in traumatized iris, maybe some amount of which is there, then it's a disaster uh, for the asking. So in these cases, I think, uh, uh, of course, even for iris clip lens, you have to do a good anterior vitrectomy, then only uh, do the intervention. I think we could, uh, we could do a survey on the practice patterns of uh, intraocular lenses, or, uh, it'll be a good idea to do it. I think there's already one which is prepared, so we can maybe just float it around. So what we did is I collected data from manufacturers, how many lenses they are per year, so that we know the trend roughly, what is the lens of preference. The Kelman is dropping down, very, very few lenses. Only Lab and few companies are making. And Iris Class suddenly is increasing. Now more and more companies started making. Even South India, three companies are making. So the volumes are going up, almost 600 to 800 lenses per month they are selling each company. So that comes around 2,400 lenses. Whereas Kalman is selling only around 20 to 30 lenses per month. That also now disappeared. You have to pre-order, buy and keep it yourself. Okay. So uh, looking to the paucity of time, I'll request uh, to end the discussion here. And uh, thank you, Ashwin, for that wonderful talk and bringing out those wonderful points. Thank you, Maipal, sir, for highlighting. I think it's the... Uh, the hesitation to do the vitrectomy in most of the anterior segment surgeons, I think that is one of the limiting factors for a single chair practitioners that we've observed. So uh, let's uh, move on to the end of, of this webinar. And uh, it's something which is interesting, the grand debate. And we have world's two finest innovators and surgeons themselves talking about ways to manage the small pupil. So let's hear from these master craftsmen and let, let them have rolling. So I would like to invite Sergio Kanabrava and Suvin Bhattacharji for uh, this uh, wonderful debate. We have on panel our president, Dr. Mahipal, Dr. Partha, the chairman scientific committee, Dr. Ramamurthy, then uh, Dr. S.P.S. Greval and Dr. Hari Priya. So I'll introduce uh, Sergio 
uh, he is the member of the uh, the Brazilian Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. He is the cataract perceptor of the Santa Casa di Bello Horizonte. He is the creator of the double flanged and the four flanged technique. And he'll be talking on his innovation, the Kana Brava ring, mastering in small pupil. So all to you, the master batsman, Sergio. Hello, hello. We can hear you, Sergio. You can start sharing your slides. Thank you. Thank you for the invitations, Dr. Sano, Dr. Partas. Thank you. For me, it's a, a honor to be here. Uh, I'm without a video here because I'm outside of my city. I'm in my farmhouse and here the, the internet is not so good. Uh, can you listen to me well? Loud and clear. Yes, very well. Okay, thank you again. It's, it's a such honor to be here. And today I will discuss about Canabrava Ring, mastering the small puppy. Uh, here my disclosure about this, this talk. And here is the ring. Uh, for the first time, a ring went in PMMA was produced without sucos. If you can see in the, in the, in the image, the ring, there is no sucos. There is one indent uh, uh, above. Uh, one indent behind. And the second one in the market in Hyatt because the... Number one is the BX pair with I ring, Oasis, Morsha, and Melly Yungi. The Canberra ring, there is. Sergio, you'll have to check your net. There is 0. 0.4 millimeters in high. My, uh, sorry. The, the voice is breaking. Personal. Can we, it's not good. Are you, are you disconnecting? Try again and soothing. The voice is cracking. You want me to take uh, Subin first? Start. If you can go Subin first, uh, I will try again no, to, to reconnect. Problem. No problem. No, no, no I, think problem. It, I think let him go on. Let him go on his week so it will keep coming. Uh, no, I think uh, we can just switch on to Subin. Sunu? Yeah. Sunil, uh, can you play the video of Subin? Subin, can we start? Uh, Okay, so uh, yeah. So yes, a bad internet okay. connection. So what I I've just, done is I've I just introduced a presentation into a video and uh, can you hear? Hello. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you, Sven. Can you hear me? Can, hear so, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Loud and clear. We have your video. Small yeah. So the small okay. introduction about sector of nine. I yeah. care private. And he is inventor of, as we all know, that blue hex pupil expander. There is none other than butta charge ring with, uh, I think, uh, with he, I think most of them has accepted his ring. So I'll much wasting his time. I think go over to Suven. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kudlu, for the kind introduction. So I have got a weak internet too. So looks uh, it's the same fate in both the debaters. So. Uh, I've sent my video, uh, my presentation as a video to the webmaster. So can I ask uh, uh, you to uh, play Neil, the Neil, video, please? The video. Sunilji, can you please play my video? It's upon the scene. Can you start from the beginning? I'm Suvin Bhattacharya, and I'm talking about the choice of pupil expander in small pupil in general and IFIS in particular. Thanks to Dr. Deepak and Dr. Neto for the videos. So the first message is elastic pupil stretches like a rubber band in his device would work. Rigid pupil does not stretch, needs to be torn, needs a bulky pupil expander. Message number two, in IFIS for the meiosis component, it's elastic pupil. So iris hooks or pupil expanders both would work because they provide a constant pupil size for good visibility and safe phaco emulsification. Whereas for iris prolapse, no device helps because it depends upon the severity of the IFIS. So when you don't have iris prolapse, it just means that it is a low grade IFIS. Chang and Campbell in 2005 distinguished the IFIS pupil from the rigid pupil that it snaps back immediately after it's stretched. So here we have an elastic pupil. So even a thin device like the B-hex can stretch it. As alternate flanges are tucked under the pupil margin, 
we have a nice 5.5 millimeter expanded pupil which is good enough for phaco emulsification and iol implantation and removal of the device is extremely easy as you untuck and draw it out of the incision on the other hand this rigid pupil needs to be stretched with either two kuglin hooks or with the pupil expander here we stretched it with two kuglin hooks so we can go ahead and use the bx pupil expander and once we have stretched it it's so easy for any device to expand the pupil and as we can see a 5.5 mm pupil is adequate for even the hardest cataract and removal of the b hex is indeed the child's play so the choice of the pupil expander depends upon how you wish to tear the rigid pupil with two kuglin hooks you could use any device including the hair thin b hex which allows you a lot of space for the pupil expander to do the job it has to be bulky let me show you a case of severe ifis where iris hooks cannot prevent iris prolapse even before i have finished my capsular rexis the iris looks like a fishing net and is completely frayed so hooks or pupil expanders do not guarantee against iris prolapse they do ensure adequate pupil size for safe phaco emulsification we see the knuckle of iris prolapse from the side port and the iris moves like a sail and it's so patulous as viscoelastic is injected the iris needs to be protected as the iol is injected and you look at that iris so iris hooks did not prevent iris prolapse it only gave me good visibility and this is a case where we have a short eye and it's posted for toric iol now the b hex cannot prevent iris prolapse but it does provide me a constant 5.5 mm pupil for safe phaco emulsification because i have good visibility throughout the iris is prolapsing through the side port and to the main incision but i can implant the iol and align it to the axis since the b hex can be removed through the side port it is invaluable in this situation and we have a nice round pupil in the end this is intraoperative meiosis where the pupil comes down as we start the phaco so a little viscoelastic is injected under the pupil margin to lift it off from the iris and the thin b hex is tucked under the pupil margin as the flange is tucked under the pupil margin and advanced to the periphery there is instant confirmation that the capsular rexis margin is not engaged and now we are back to a comfort zone and the surgery becomes so much safer so in ifis the pupil expander should require a small incision should be very thin and should be able to exit through the side port so if you want a simple device which allows a lot of space in the anterior chamber it's the b hex whereas if you're looking for a device to tear the fibrotic pupil it would be the malugin or the apx but then you could do that with two kuglin hooks easily please look up eofta.com for the 10 tips for phaco emulsification in small pupil thank you Thank you, Sunil ji. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, AIS, for this opportunity. So, if we can have Sergio back, that was Sergio very back. Presentation. Yes. Yes. Can so, I try? Yes, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let me see. Let me see again. I think now my internet. I did the speed test. I think the internet now is better. Let me see. I put in a good word for you, Sergio. Now it's better. Uh, okay, uh, are you restarting this point? Uh, then this is the first ring he uh, produced in PMMEA, uh, PMMEA without sucos. Okay, you have idents and one ident about and above and one ident beh behind. And then because this, you have only 4.4 uh, millimeters in high. The second one in the market, the the number one in this point is the BX for for my friend my friend Suvan, and uh, but in compare with uh, Irene Oasis Morshir Maliugi, you have 0 0.7 to 0.9 millimeters. Here you can see how the the ring engage in the iris like a wave. There is no sucos in this ring. Uh, the the sound now is good. My sound. Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. I like to, to, to call my ring to challenge ring because uh, the, the learning curve to, to, to this, this ring is not easy. It's, it's challenge to, to, to start this learning curve. But when you have the learning curve finished, you can, you can do a lot of challenge case as I can show you here. 
reach into it uh, so, so tiny, small, small people. And you can see this patient is a, a small, sh a, a shallow, a, a very shallow anterior chamber. Then uh, you can connect first the small one like that, and use like to stretch in the iris. And then you connect the second and the third small one. And finally, you connect the, the hooks to, to, give, to give the stability. Here, another case that you can see, connect the same way, the small indent behind, uh, uh, in the center, and the second and the one, and the, and the third one. And you can see how the, the bigger one goes, uh, 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 goes above the iris to give stability. And the final two rooks give the final stability. In this patient, I perform uh, Yaman technique, but why, Sergio? You don't did you don't did the Canabrava technique? Your technique in this in this kind of patient, because in patient with small people, I suggest to use Yaman technique because you can insert you can insert the IOL uh, inside the eye. Then I have some some tips, some hints here. I like to do one flange in one side first. And again, I use a, a micro forceps to hold the haptic, and then I remove the, the, the insulin needle. Then you can see, and uh, now I will remove the, 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 the bag. And then I remove the, the ring from the eye. I use a simple micro forceps forceps. I disengage it on the eyes, I remove a simple micro forceps forceps. Then a patient, a flex, uh, because this ring, uh, you connect the same, the same way. And then I go with the patient in my hospital, I have a Johnson & Johnson catalyst. And you can see the ring stays stable inside the eye because uh, it has 0.4 millimeter high. Then this is, is, you can introduce it in the 0.4 millimeter incision. Then I back to the, the operating room and I like to insert first a capsule tensor ring. And after to insert, I like it because when I insert the capsule tensor ring before, you can stabilize it, your bag. And after to do the fake emulsification, insert a three piece IOL, I remove the ring from the eye using a simple Mac first with forceps. And then I finish the surgery. I finish the surgery, fixate the iris using a simple knot, as you can see. And then it is finished. Then here, uh, another uh, catalyst report, Johnson & Johnson to see another patient that you can see how the ring stays stable in the anterior chamber uh, during the fake emulsification. Uh, and it's and here is the, the ring. Uh, today it's available in all South America and the uh, Europe CA market are, 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 uh, is coming uh, to go around the road. Then thank you again uh, for the invitation for me. It's an honor all time to invite me to talk to India. Thank you. Excellent presentation, uh, Sergio. I think uh, uh, now the real debate starts. I think we have all senior panelists who will give their own opinion. I think uh, uh, we will be very much transparent as far as the opinion is concerned. Dr. Partha is smiling. His choice will be different. And uh, even I think Dr. Maipal is also around. I think I to start with Dr. Partha, what is your opinion? If you given a chance, similar condition, do you will use Sergio's ring or you'll go back to your close friend who is your neighbor, Dr. Suen? <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, KP, for uh, you know throwing the ball in my court. Well, uh, since I've used uh, Suven's ring and the BX ring for quite a long time now, I'm very comfortable with that ring. And obviously, you know, as lazy people, we keep on the comfort seat as much as possible. However, I just have a few questions for Sergio. Sergio, are you there? Are you listening? Yes, Angie, I'm here. Okay. So uh, what I thought is uh, the ring is a little bulky, Sergio, and you had a little... Uh, I mean, the manipulation on the iris is uh, a little, 
there and uh, the rotation of the ring. And uh, uh, my question would be that how much of iris depigmentation would normally occur when anybody is placing the ring uh, to widen the pupil? and removal as well. So removal, during the removal, what I saw is you were twirling the ring outside and uh, that would also, I believe, uh, would it uh, take off the iris pigments uh, and cause a little bit of maybe iris inflammation? Means I want your opinion there. Marta, it's an important point uh, because this in all my presentation I tell, this is a challenge ring. Uh, for example, BX is easier to implant a uh, Maliugin ring is easier, the curve, curve, learning curve, but the Canabrava rings is really right, hard, the learning curve. Then you need to do a, a wet lab to avoid these things, this, this, this concern you, you told me. But after, after you complete your learning curve, what I can say, I can say is no ring uh, uh, do challenge case like my ring because it is in a PMEA, you can you use it in the fibrosis case and it has a 0.4 millimeter high then it's a, the it's a advantage is a PMAA and, and alternate parts but it's really is a challenge case you need to avoid all the thing you 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 say you said okay so let's go over to the next panelist yeah dr mahipal sir uh, kp uh, the uh, issue here is actually experience. So as the Canavara ring is not uh, easily available in India, I have no personal experience on it. Uh, but I think whatever uh, Partha said, it is a matter of uh, being happy and uh, what is in your comfort zone. If you're getting good results with any particular thing, uh, at times you don't wish to change. Now, obviously the two uh, things uh, what uh, our friend Suvain and what Sergio are uh, trying to do is that Suvain is trying to make the size. So the comparison is actually always with Malugin. So from a Malugin, Suvain tried to make it less bulky so that he can push it through even a side port. And the only thing is that obviously because it is less bulky and less strong, so it needs some uh, manipulation to uh, kind of uh, uh, stretch the iris and then put the ring. Uh, so that is what Suvain uh, has really done and uh, it has its advantages. And what Sergio has actually done is to make the uh, ring more bulky and to be making it more stable. Uh, obviously, I feel because it's going to, even in a fibrosis case, what Suvain showed was that he could use two uh, Ys of a manipulator and uh, do a stretch and then put the ring. Uh, there will be spring trick tier with that also. And I think what uh, Sergio has shown, uh, I have no personal experience, but I think that will also have a little bit of a swing trick tier. Uh, it would require more difficulty and more skill set. That's what I feel uh, to put in the uh, Canavara ring. So as they say in FACO, there are 100 ways to skin a cat. I think there are several uh, rings that are available. The iris retractors work pretty well in majority of the cases. Malugan ring works very well. Uh, Suen's ring works very well. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages. I wouldn't wish to take any sides because I don't have personal first-hand experience with Sergio's ring. So it's uh, Im, uh, improper for me to comment on something that I have not worked on. Thank you, sir. But we have with us Dr. Hari Priya. And I think she's part of Arvind's system. They, they have been, uh, she's been doing their manufacturing so many rings even in the Arvind system. So I just wanted to ask her to give her a chance, which kind of ring you prefer to manufacture at your system? I don't know. Dr. Hari, please. Yeah, she is not ready. Yeah, Dr. Ramurthy, sir, your opinion regarding the, these two rings? I am always called when somebody is not available. <laughs> No, sir. <laughs> okay. So why are you so available, Ram? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I think uh, that was a beautiful video from uh, Suvin. And there's a very important point that he made about, you know, rigid pupil and uh, uh, elastic pupils. So I find in quite often you can get away without using any of these devices. The first thing I would do when faced with a 3 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter uh, pupil is to go ahead and fill in some co cohesive viscoelastic and you know keep make keep the uh, make the eyeball really tense 
very often you find that you get a 4 or a 4.5 millimeter uh, uh, pupil expansion just with this and maybe you can use some intracameral mediatic also that itself would suffice and you can go ahead, especially if it's not a very hard cataract you can go ahead and complete your fecal emulsification and sometimes if there is a membrane over there if you just peel it off and do these devices then maybe a device is not required then secondly when it becomes a device becomes a, becomes a requirement one thing i have seen both with the maligan ring as well as suvens ring is that uh, in extremely small rigid pupils it's quite difficult to introduce and some amount of stretching that becomes necessary to enlarge it to about 3 3.5 mm before you can introduce the, these rings and uh, but one, especially in a case of ifis i would keep away from completely uh, uh, damaging the sphincter in any way in these cases i find that uh, using a iris hook is helpful because even if it's a, a pimp 2.5 2 mm rigid pupil i am able to use the iris hooks and get enough amount of expansion and uh, uh, of course suvens uh, ring i have used it it's a great product i think uh, i find it more comfortable than a maligan ring simply because uh, it goes through a much smaller incision and removal as well as introduction is extremely easy and maybe a 3 3.5 mm pupil i go ahead and use that often it's for me is a toss up between iris hooks and uh, uh, suvens ring and uh, sergio's ring was very impressive i have no personal experience with that and uh, obviously the fact that he could do it in a 2 mm pupil and he could even do a uh, elastius docking is something which is impressive maybe look forward to use it but i think uh, atmanirbhar is the uh, tone today and uh, if you have to opt for something suvens in the bar thank you <laughs> dr grewal sir your opinion is around dr grewal yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. i'm here You see, yes, one sir. thing I like about both the rings is that both the rings dilate the pupil. So, so th th that's something, something really what both the rings are delivering, what both the rings claim to be. And uh, it's purely a matter of the training. It's a matter of which product you are you are trained into it. And uh, as Sergio rightly said, that maybe his ring needs a longer longer learning curve. and once you are you are used to that then you can handle that uh, my personal experience i haven't used either of them so far i i'll be able to mostly manage the cases even without uh, using a ring or if used i am still old set and using the iris hooks thank you dr devashi sir your comments yeah uh Uh, the sergio's ring uh, looked very impressive but i would go with the panel and say that you know everything works well and uh, whichever is available and is cheap but i would beg to differ with ram and uh, uh, sps on this issue that uh, when it is i fis you know we need to put a ring uh, because oh, oh. in the later part it generally starts misbehaving and then uh it becomes very difficult to put the ring because then you can injure the excess and do so many things so i i think you got me wrong um, uh uh there yeah. was the sense that you know in case it is ifis uh, it's definitely some kind of a dilating device is required what i don't want to do is to even stretch the pupil to even introduce that device so in these cases though suven showed some difficulty with the um i use hooks in place i normally use five hooks and one uh, sub incisionally this gives me a reasonably good uh, uh, dilatation for the surgery to be performed adequately so i would not really do any stretching in these cases but definitely if it's an ifis case and it's a rigid pupil go ahead and use a device yeah i understand ram but uh, yeah uh, uh, i'm of the opinion that uh, i would expand uh, the pupil so that i see well of course the hooks do the uh, job well but uh, sometimes you know the the, uh, the irish is so floppy that it keep, keeps coming even with the hooks on it keeps coming in the main wound and uh, that kind of thing so essentially i'm quite uh, comfortable with expanders and uh, i think this is uh, i don't have no first hand experience with the sergio's uh, ring but it looks impressive it just uh, is a thing that i mean 
what price and the availability so yeah so, uh, so when uh, the uh, the video that you showed actually when you are showing iris prolapse from the main wound actually if you put another hook there uh, that solves the problem yeah so actually that is uh, uh, the thing that normally is uh, being done if you do iris hooks yeah so, uh, so can... any comments from you sir dr jk reddy unmute uh, dr jk reddy dr jk you are muted dr reddy you are muted uh, i generally i agree with dr D, what the dr d has said when the people is very small where we cannot perform more, uh these rings are also becoming little difficult i tried it's not question of i am not tried i tried the rings uh, this is becoming very difficult either maligin or uh, swin also sometimes it's we have to expand but as the iris hooks up goes when the really small people like 2 mm 4 5 mm usually we are able to manage after some experience without any expanders um, unless it's really gives trouble so the use of rings are becoming slowly it is coming down in practice uh, when the, compared with our initial enthusiasm um, now we are going back to iris hooks uh, or no ring we learn how to do without rings in a moderate people small small people yeah shivan uh, you want to yeah, say something yeah so uh, what i want to say is again i would like to emphasize that ifs people is typically elastic so you can use anything that's something you must understand if it is 2 mm or 1 mm or 4 mm really doesn't matter if it's a typically ifs people it is elastic that is the nature of the people now if it's a 3 mm and fibrotic people then you'll have to stretch it anyway whether you stretch it with the hooks or with the malugan ring or with the uh, surgeon's ring or the bhex it doesn't matter so it's it's if it's like a rubber band it will stretch if you i mean it will expand but if it's like a string it, it there's no scope for it it's like you have to tear the string to how to tear the string up to you so if it's a typical ifis it, it is in elastic people the size really doesn't So, Bar Bartha, I think if uh, we can uh, to finish off the debate, let us ask both these guys who have commercial interest as to how many rings are sold per month in the world. So, when uh, how many rings do you sell per month? Sir, <laughs> <laughs> so that's like it's, asking. It's our a CS. secret. It's a secret. <laughs> yes. That, so that will show the popularity. No, how many rings you are selling per month? Uh, uh, that my. We'll come with the figures. We'll come with the figures very soon. <laughs> <laughs> What the yeah, manufacturer? It's a secret. <laughs> That's a trade secret, I believe. Huh? So, Dr. Last word from you. Dr. Reddy gave the figures on the iris clip lens manufacturers thing. So why can't Suvan and uh, this thing? You must be. <laughs> no, no, we'll, uh, the, no, nothing, nothing very confidential about that. It's just about yeah. the availability. Yes, in India, definitely we are leading, and I know that. But... Okay. And, uh, He is ready. Uh, doesn't uh, manufacture uh, risk influences. Because so uh, there was no uh, sales at Morgan Ring usage. Uh, I think that. I think the, 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 the VX is everybody is waiting for your presidential dinner, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, word from Sergio. I think uh, let's have a word from Sergio. Sergio, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So how many rings do you Would sell? Would you like to use Suvens ring? Sergio, would you like to use Suvens ring? Yes, for me is a is a pleasure. How how I told you before, uh, in serving ring, I ring, a uh, Maliugi ring is amazing rings to start your learning curve in Irish expansion ring, and the amazing ring to do in a simple small case, small pupil case. I I suggest all my fellows and residents. If you want to start in uh, uh, small people with uh, eye expansion ring, first try Maliugi, try a ring, try serving because it's easier than my ring. But after, if you need to do a challenge, a really challenge case, I tell my ring is better for challenge case. It's it's I have more than 200. Uh, uh, I experience more than 200 patients with all rings you believe you you know. I ring. and it's my my concern for for learning curve okay now so when would you like to use the kana brava ring when you are challenged
thank you i think uh, we have had both the last comments and uh, the debate has been a great one i think sir maypal sir and all panelists i'm sure would agree that uh, we have the best in the world we have the best in the world so uh, i think over to stonu and uh, kudlu and uh, maypal sir i think uh, if word I from dr maypal sir uh, well uh, i was just can i make a comment on the Dr. Mahipal's question to Dr. Suvain, if I can answer on his behalf, I think it's just like asking a lady what is her age. So that that is the reason both Suvain and Sergio were a bit hesitant in answering that uh, number, what they are selling. Oh, no. you, sir. I don't think they need to be apologetic about it. Actually, I'll be proud if I have a product and my baby is doing well. Uh, I would uh, give the numbers as long as uh, Suvain has some tax evasion uh, uh, things to do. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I'll be happy to say that I am selling one thousand rings a month or two thousand rings a month. So that shows the popularity. I don't know, Sergio, why are you uh, hesitant in saying as to how many are sold? Because uh, the proof lies in the pudding that uh, basically how many people are selling those things. He cat diplomatically, Suwen said that's the largest selling uh, thing in India. So I can I, I can tell you the figures. We are selling about eight hundred rings a month pre-COVID. And okay. post COVID, we are a little stuck now. And the That's problem right. is, we have a lot of demand overseas, but because we are not FDA registered or CE mark, we have our own reasons. So, Infaik is uh, nodding. Uh, she is one person who wants to use it, but I just can't send it over. There are a lot of people who use it uh, unofficially. So uh, that is a constraint that we have. But once we have that, I think we'll roll out much more now, my many more. Great. So you want any help from us? We'll be there to help you. Ah, uh, we all need all the help. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. I need some shares of your company, right? <laughs> I need you as an advisor. Okay, advisors also get ESOPs, right? I so, think. Uh, <laughs> I, great. I think. Uh, I think it was a great session, uh, uh, Sergio. Maybe do you wish to comment as to how many of these you sell? Uh, in this moment, I I are selling only in the in uh, South America, but I really can uh, uh, share it because it's a company company. Uh, how can I say? Okay, fine. Anyway, I think it's, it's uh, a secret. I, I really, I really can, I really can, I really can uh, share no it. No, but no uh, today, you are a sell only in Brazil and some countries in South America. And so maybe you, give us, us some. Give us some samples, and we'll use, and then we can uh, uh, talk about your rings also. <laughs> for me, it's a pleasure. Who wants to receive a, a sample? Send me email. I will send the email for the company. I think the, all I, of I, us want I, samples. Sir. <laughs> 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 I, I think. I think. I think. I, I don't. I don't. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think Hotaeli uh, from Spain would like to to send some samples. Uh, because it's important to 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 talk about the ring. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, the scientific committee has always has done a great job, and Sonu Kudlu and Partha uh, keep up the good work. I think uh, always having uh, interesting webinars, and uh, uh, great to be part of them always. Uh, back to you, Partha. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and uh, thanks to everyone, all our presenters who have. Presented mind-boggling videos uh, to our panelists and uh, to our overseas uh, experts, Professor Chi. I think it's so late in the night, and uh, you still are there. I'm so happy, and thank you so much for being till the last. And uh, Sergio, also thank you so much for you know taking time at your farmhouse and uh, <laughs> getting connected to India from your farmhouse. And we love to have you uh, in our webinars again and again. And uh, thanks to all our panelists who have been the experts and given your opinions. Thank you very much. Uh, Kudlu and uh, Sonu have worked so hard to yes, bring them very, together. Very Yes, yes, to bring this together, all credit to them, all credit to them. So a last word of thank from Kudlu and Sonu, please. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Kudlu, please. Thank you, sir. It was like uh, 
the first of all i since you had thanked everybody the man behind this show none other than uh, sonu who has taken so much of work in the end only i was with him but he has communicated with the, all the panelists and all the chair person the program was excellent first of all i have to really thank uh, uh, our uh, president aws maipal sir he was with us from beginning till end dr namrata sharma uh, and our chairman scientific Partha Bishwas and all our uh, scientific committee member, Dr. Parishit, Dr. Amit, Dr. Balla, uh, Dr. Fairoza, Dr. Uh, Somshila Murthy. Everybody was chipped in in between whenever we wanted. And also, I thank all the presenters, especially the uh, international speaker like uh, uh, Sri Fashion of Professor Chin Su Fai, and also uh, the Kano Brawa. He has also chipped in with a very nice presentation. All our uh, Indian faculties, even senior uh, surgeons like Dr. Titiyal Sir, Suhas Haldipurkar Sir, Grewal Sir, everybody ch chipped in. Once again, from the bottom of my heart, I thank everybody who, who helped Ram Murthy Sir, even uh, Haripriya Madam, who, Rajesh Sinha, who really chipped in with the very good presentation. Even in spite of we have been with the uh, doing a lot of cataract surgery every time we keep learning so many things out of our cataract webinars once again i thank i think we'll be coming back with uh, under parthas guidance in a coming soon with uh, some more edition of uh, cataract and refractive sessions with the permission from aws headquarters thank you one and all i think i'll just uh, like to mention special thanks to professor g for uh, we are really very sorry for keeping you so late the night and thank you so much for every time accepting our invite sergio thank you so much you are a dear friend and you have been always been with us i think uh, aios is all about leadership and it you know starts from the top our president the dynamic president who on a single call would answer in a minute i think that is a wonderful quality i should really appreciate dr mahipal sir a single phone call or a mail or a whatsapp within a minute is answered i think uh, that's thank you so very much sir namrata madam she would never say no to anything and our chairman scientific committee partha who has so much confidence in the scientific team that he would leave everything on us i think these are the qualities which make a society you know move forward and yes scientifically as steve said that we are one of the most learned community in the world and challenges innovations and the video kind of stuff i think india's are far ahead and looking to what suvan presented and sergio presented i think yes indian ophthalmology is you know is bound to grow leaps and leaps thank you dr devasi sir uh, suvan grewal sir dr tial sir jk reddy amit parikshit somashila haripriya ma'am maipal sir uh, feroz dr rama murthy i think they are here dr bhalla and uh, last but not the least let's keep things rolling and the basic aim of this meeting was to deliver some pearls to all our fellow members who are struggling or are in the process of learning so i think goals well achieved thank you so much thank you and uh, good night to everybody have a very very safe year ahead and till the next webinar we are back with you.